Education and training has been one of the hardest hit sectors during the pandemic. For this reason, partnerships between higher education institutions and the private sector in the region is crucial in contributing to graduate employability. University and the employer to engagement is not just an option, but a necessity to produce a competitive and the future ready to work for us. So right. it taught me how to be more sensitive and understanding to other people's different cultures or working styles, political and social worldview and the identities that they associate with. The proven records of how we skillfully navigate differences and play well in a team made up of people from like really diverse backgrounds. If we do nothing about the curriculum, our, our, our basic curriculum now, uh, and the world continue to change, uh, there will come a day where our students are equipped with knowledge that is not what the world comes. Ranging from software development, to cloud and data, data and AI, cybersecurity, privacy and trust. This is really going to be the main um, type of opportunities that is out there. I would still encourage uh, the internationalization and mobility, uh, but the design needs to be something more inclusive, more flexible. We need to get the engagement of the stakeholders, employers are, are included, and assessment is a key. Congratulations on the official launch. The EU is very proud to support this process in ASEAN for the SHARE program. I am extremely pleased that the EU and the, through the EU SHARE program has launched the Communities of Practice. The importance of a community of practice goes beyond the exchange of ideas within the community, but actually the unity and collaboration between practice and policy. The SHARE program continues its commitment to support the future readiness of ASEAN students and graduates through the implementation of digital modalities of internationalization, such as virtual exchange, collaborative online international learning, and digital credentials. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to Share Policy Dialogue 14, the contribution of higher education partnership in Southeast Asia towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, both those of you joining online and those joining us here in Bangkok for this hybrid event. I'm happy to be joining you as well and very honored to be your MC for today's opening session. My name is Nathanan and I'm a program officer with Southeast Asia Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center specializing in higher education and development or SMEO Right I'd like to take this first few minutes to walk you through a brief overview of today's program. So today from 3 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. in Bangkok, Jakarta time, we have an official opening ceremony. This will be followed by a keynote speech from UNESCO Bangkok at 3.30 and then at 3.45 p.m. We have panel discussions on youth partnership and partnership between private sector and civil societies. And this will conclude the program of today. And now allow me to do some housekeeping announcement for our virtual participants as well. Um, when joining each session, 
I would like you to turn off your microphone so not to interrupt the speakers and other participants. And in case you have questions or want to exchange directly with speakers or panelists, you can send questions or share your views through the chat box. And lastly, if you need some snacks or drinks to refresh yourself, you can go grab your refreshment at any time. But please do not lock off the session so that you don't have to go through the process of locking in again. And before proceeding to the opening ceremony, may I call upon the following speakers to move up to the stage. Firstly, Professor Dr. Sirire Songsit Vilai, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation from Thailand. Assistant Professor Dr. Rom Yen Gosai Ganon, Center Director from Semio Raihet. Dr. Rojo Chow Jr., Assistant Director of Education, Youth and Sports Division from the ASEAN Secretariat. Dr. Sholathit Thirathiti, Executive Director of the ASEAN University Network. And Mr. Darren McDermott, Chair Program Team Leader, please come take your seat on the stage and get ready for your speech. Um, before we start, we have a group photo session first. So um, please keep your mask on for the first shot and on the count of three, one, two, three, say cheers. And another shot with your mask off, please. One, two, three. Okay, now that um, we are finished with the group photo sessions, um, ladies and gentlemen, to begin the 14 chair policy dialogue, it is my honor to welcome Professor Dr. Sirira Song Sivilai, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation from Thailand to deliver his opening remarks. Let's give him a big round of applause. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and perhaps good evening uh, to uh, participants uh, both here and uh, online. Uh, I think that I'm not, well, I'm quite far from other people, so I'm allowed to uh, take the mask off. And uh, just to tell you that I have been tested uh, for COVID-19 uh, both uh, using RT-PCR and the rapid test uh, about six times in the past five days. So um, uh, hopefully I um, should be okay. Uh, my last test was about two hours ago. So, uh, Excellency uh, Mr. David Daly, Ambassador of the uh, European Union uh, Delegation to Thailand, uh, Assistant Professor uh, Dr. Lom Yen Ko Sai Kanon, uh, Simeo Laihet, Director, uh, Dr. Roger Chow, uh, Assistant Director, Head of Education, Youth and Sports uh, Division of the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, Mr. Chikelu uh, Oyaki, uh, Director of uh, UNESCO Asia and Pacific uh, Regional Bureau for Education, uh, Dr. Cholatit uh, Tilatiti, Executive Director of the ASEAN University Network, AUN, uh, Mr. Darlene McDermott, Chair, uh, Program Team Leaders, uh, Honorable Speakers, uh, Distinguished Participants, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Higher High Education, uh, Science, Research and Innovation uh, of the Kingdom of Thailand, uh, I would like to extend uh, 
uh, my very warm uh, welcome uh, to uh, all of you uh, for uh, this very important uh, dialogue, uh, both uh, on site uh, here in Bangkok and online. The uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics that uh, we have faced uh, in the past uh, two years have changed a lot in the way that uh, we are communicating and uh, we are uh, working. I'm uh, especially really happy uh, to welcome uh, several participants uh, who come to Bangkok uh, physically uh, for this meeting. Uh, I myself have just returned uh, from an education-related mission uh, from Laos PDR. And uh, I think the event that happened in the past month also uh, signaled uh, to us uh, that uh, the way uh, the pandemic has hit us very, very hard in the past two years uh, is easing up and we will we, we able to communicate uh, both well physically and uh, on the online format and uh, the experience uh, we have in the past uh, two years uh, will uh, bring up a better way uh, how we uh, work uh, together. It is honor uh, for me uh, to uh, give remarks on behalf of the ministry and especially on behalf of the minister, uh, Professor Anik Lao Thamathat, uh, who also asked me to uh, convey his message uh, for you uh, in this uh, meeting. And I would like uh, to mention that the uh, chair policy dialogue 14 uh, is a uh, very important event. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity first to thank uh, our partners, uh, the chair program, uh, the uh, CMO I had, uh, the ASEAN Secretariat uh, by the uh, Education, Youth and Sport Divisions, uh, and the UNESCO Asia Pacific uh, Regional Bureau uh, for Education uh, for organizing uh, this policy dialogue. I'm uh, delighted to see an outstanding progress to the chair program. Uh, I myself uh, is also uh, involved uh, actively in another uh, forums uh, regarding uh, the EU and the ASEAN uh, dialogue on science, technology, and innovation. And uh, we see that the, uh, the relationship between the EU and ASEAN uh, in several areas, including on higher high education, uh, science, research, and innovation is very important. The CHAIR program is an efficient mechanism uh, for strengthening uh, academic cooperation between the EU and, the, uh, and ASEAN, especially in higher education sphere. This program has served as a platform uh, for universities, uh, key stakeholders and representatives uh, from regional and inter-regional organizations to share views and experiences and propose strategies for further higher education collaboration to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, particularly on the SDG 4 uh, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Furthermore, uh, chairing case studies and best practices in ASEAN higher education are also included uh, in this program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, the past two years has been immensely challenging for humanities uh, to confront with the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has caused disruption of life and impact almost all sections of the society, social well-being, health, economic, and including education. It had forced a massive shift away from learning and teaching in traditional settings with physical interaction. The sudden change has urged high education sectors to adapt 
the teaching and learning, and also set up the policy in accordance with the new circumstances. In response to the COVID-19 pandemics, most universities, and I should say that all universities, uh, especially in Thailand, has switched to virtual classroom almost overnight, where technology and innovation has played important roles for education. However, learning does not only happen in the classroom. Uh, lifelong learning should be promoted as well to enhance uh, people's skill for better quality of life. We have learned a lot from the past two years. We have learned that learning and teachings, uh, there are many, many dimensions and many aspects uh, how we uh, conduct uh, that way. Reconnecting people uh, after the COVID-19 is, is important. We just also embrace by uh, what COVID-19 brings us, uh, whereby uh, we understand that online education, long distance education is also very important. And combining both physical uh, way of uh, learning and teachings together with the virtual uh, online format of teachings would bring us uh, a better way uh, in enhancing high, high education sphere. This pandemic has led to many changes, and I believe that those changes are important mechanisms, uh, important way as accelerating factors for the directions of further development. It is a great opportunity for, for high education stakeholders to work in close collaboration to cultivate deep knowledge and crucial skills needed in the evolving era. I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing uh, my sincere gratitude to our participants uh, for taking your valuable time to attend the chair policy dialogue. My appreciation uh, also goes to uh, guest speakers and all parties concerned for your contributions in providing points of view, suggestions, and directions for further higher education. I wish all of you a fruitful deliberations and productive outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Sirida. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to express great appreciation to our guests of honor for such an excellent opening remark from the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation from Thailand. For the next opening remark, we are greatly honored to receive a blessing from His Excellency, Mr. David Daly, Ambassador of the European Union Delegation to Thailand. Although he cannot be here with us today, he sent us a recorded message. May I now have the recorded remark from His Excellency, Mr. David Daly, on the screen. Thank you. Professor Suryong, Permanent Secretary of Higher Education, Research and Innovation, the Government of Thailand. Dr. Ramyen Kosai Kanut. Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, Regional Center Director. Dr. Roger Chow, Jr., Assistant Director and Head of Education, Youth and Sports in the ASEAN Secretariat. Mr. Shigeru Ayogi, Director, Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education, UNESCO in Bangkok. Dr. Choltis Tirati, Executive Director, ASEAN University Network. Mr. Darren McDermott, Share Team Leader. The Share Team and European Consortium Partners. The EU delegation to Thailand would like to warmly welcome you to the 14th Policy Dialogue of the Programme Support to Higher Education in ASEAN also known as the SHARE program. 
The title of the policy dialogue is The Contribution of Higher Education Partnerships in Southeast Asia Towards the Achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. Indeed, the contribution of higher education is crucial in our societies and to support sustainable development. Education is essential to the achievement of all the sustainable development goals. And it is necessary to reduce inequalities and to promote inclusive and sustainable growth. In the post COVID era, it would be important for the global recovery. Education is a fundamental right and the foundation of resilient, peaceful and sustainable societies. Education is the basis and a catalyst for the green transition. It enables citizens to harness the opportunities of digital development. It brings hope and protection to those affected by humanitarian crisis and forced displacement. The EU reaffirms the paramount importance of quality education for children and young people in and beyond the European Union. The EU has put human development at the heart of our partnerships. We would like to ensure that young people and women are involved in initiatives that can have a say and can be empowered. We want to make sure that no one is left behind, even in difficult times. This year, 2022, is very special to all of us. This is the European Year of Youth, highlighting the importance of youth to build a better future, greener, more inclusive and digital. This year, we are also commemorating the 35th anniversary of the Erasmus programme, which is the flagship programme for higher education and one of the best examples of European integration and partnerships. Also this year, the EU and ASEAN are commemorating our 45th anniversary since the establishment of our relations. Since 1977, the EU-ASEAN partnership has been based on shared values and common goals, working to ensure peace and security in the region, building sustainable connectivity, promoting free and fair trade, and supporting sustainable development. Higher education and students have always been an important element in the EU's relationship with ASEAN and its member states. They play an essential role in the future of our two regions. SHARE is the EU's flagship programme in the field of higher education with ASEAN, in addition to the Erasmus Plus programme. The 14th SHARE policy dialogue is an avenue to showcase the EU support to the Sustainable Development Goals. We want to highlight the contributions of partnerships in higher education in Southeast Asia and their pivotal role in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The policy dialogue will discuss how best to promote partnerships between higher education, private sector and civil society. The outcomes of this event will also feed the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference that will take place in May 2022. Finally, I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers and participants for their contribution and participation in this policy dialogue. I wish you all a productive discussion during the three days ahead. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the cordial introductory remark from His Excellency, Mr. David Daly from the European Union delegation to Thailand. Next, I'd like to invite Assistant Professor Dr. Rom Yen Gosai Ganon, Center Director of Simeo Rahet to take the stage. Thank you.
Permanent Secretary, Professor Siri Rak Song Sivilai, Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation, Thailand. Excellency Mr. David Daly, Ambassador of the EU Delegation to Thailand. My dear colleagues, partners, ladies and gentlemen, good day. Sawadika. On behalf of Simeo Raihead, I would like to warmly welcome you to the Chair Policy Dialogue 14, organized under the theme, The Contribution of Higher Education Partnerships in, in Southeast Asia Towards the Achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. My dear colleagues, from policymakers and higher education leaders to researchers and learners, we must rethink the future of higher education. Amid this outbreak of the COVID-19 and the multiple disruptions of climate change, conflicts, and inequality facing us. As we are all aware, Southeast Asia is a diverse region, yet we are experiencing challenges that is interconnected in nature, such as the conflicts over international resource management, natural disasters caused by climate change, environmental problems of haze and ocean debris, pandemic, and also changes in the nature of work and livelihood, as well as many other non-security threats. This global backdrop has driven us, the EU chair, ASEAN Education, Youth and Sports Division, UNESCO Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education, ASEAN University Network, and Simeo Raihead to come together to carry out this very important policy dialogue. We highly hope that this platform, based upon our synergy, our partnership, and our shared goals, will result in the key recommendations and practical actions for a future ready and sustainable region. Our next three days program has been put together with the aim of creating collective intelligence of how higher education can work together in partnership with other stakeholders for the goals. On the first day, as MC has already introduced, beside the keynote speech from UNESCO on the role of higher education partnerships in the, program, in the promotion of SDG, our youth will share their views on the future of sustainable higher education in Southeast Asia. So we should be listening to them. And we are very eager also to hear from the private sector about their good practices, working in collaboration with the higher education in preparing future-oriented workers, entrepreneurs, and the global citizens. The second day would be focusing more on the international higher education partnerships and the UN SDGs based on the case study from Southeast Asia followed by the sharing of the Share Gender and EDI Research Study by British Council. And for last, um, this research highlights inclusive partnership to make sure our voices are heard. For the last session tomorrow, the Asia Euro Foundation Education Department would discuss how to achieve inclusive higher education in ASEAN region with some good practices. The third day addresses the issue of how research partnerships can contribute to achieving the SDGs and how research collaboration in science can help bridging the gaps in higher education research. We will conclude the program through a brainstorming session among the co-organizers you know, who are sitting on this panel. Um, the outcome of this uh, interactive policy dialogue would be our contribution to the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference in 2022. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation for the support of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation of Thailand and the EU de delegations in Bangkok. I would like to also thank you for all you being here and virtually, and I look forward to our interactive dialogue to enhance our stronger partnerships for the sustainable development of the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rom Yen, for an inspiring opening speech from Samuel Raihead. Now, may I invite Dr. Roger Chow Jr., Assistant Director of Education, Youth, 
and sports direction from the ASEAN Secretariat to give the next opening remark. Thank you. Professor Siri, Siri Rai Songsi Vilai, um, Permanent Secretary of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation, Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation of Thailand. His Excellency David Daly, Ambassador of the EU Delegation to Thailand, friends, partners, colleagues, and stakeholders in ASEAN and higher education in general. Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. On behalf of the Education, Youth, and Sports Division of the ASEAN Secretariat, I would like to wel warmly welcome all of you in participating in this 14th Policy Dialogue, where a lot and all regional stakeholders, organizations in the ASEAN region are participating and joining hands to explore how we can actually improve higher education partnerships in contributing to the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. I will make my speech short. I only have three items to discuss. This particular policy dialogue is an example of higher education partnerships. You see around you all the regional organizations working on higher education in ASEAN. You have UNESCO as well, the regional office. You have researchers, higher education institutions, um, non-governmental uh, organizations, researchers sitting around this table and joining us. Uh, virtually to discuss experiences, challenges, opportunities, and insights on how we can make higher education better in the ASEAN region. Second thing, I would like to highlight that in relation to the sustainable development agenda, higher education plays a significant role. And as such, building partnerships in higher education is very important, not only for us to advance how we can contribute the changing challenge, uh, to uh, adjust to the changing challenges of a changing world of work, but also to contribute to socioeconomic development, social development, human development, and basically building a sustainable and peaceful global community. Last but not the least, I would like to highlight that the recent launch of the community of practice for ASEAN higher education mobility is something new where we have the grassroots contributing to the discussions on how higher education can improve and also contributes to um, uh, higher education partnerships. So ladies and gentlemen, friends of higher education, welcome and I look forward to our discussion and our inputs too making ASEAN higher education and higher education better in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Roger, for a wonderful opening remark from the ASEAN Secretariat. Next, we would have a recorded opening remark from Mr. Shigeru Aoyagi, Director of Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education from UNESCO Bangkok. Thank you. Permanent Secretary Sidi Lu Song Sivalai, Ambassador David Dali, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Warm greetings from UNESCO Bangkok and the Asia Pacific Regional Bureau for Education. First of all, congratulations on the organization of this very important policy dialogue. The timing of this event and your focus on partnership are significant. UNESCO was born in the aftermath of the two world wars out of a simple but very firm conviction that political and economic cooperation between countries are not enough to build lasting peace. Reconciliation and development require strong foundations, deeply rooted in societal interactions and build upon 
intellectual and moral solidarity. This vision is at the heart of UNESCO's mandate, and I believe should be at the center of your focus over the next three days, reviewing the role of higher education partnerships to achieve the sustainable development goals. As you know, UNESCO aims to foster the growth of a peaceful global citizenry. Through education, sciences, and culture, we aim to inform, inspire, and engage people everywhere to deepen understanding and promote respect for each other and our planet. At UNESCO Bangkok, our Together for Peace initiative, what we call T4P, seeks to build peace in the minds of all young people by working with Ministry of Education in Asia and the Pacific with the goal of integrating positive peace into education. We believe that higher education should not only prepare skilled labor, but also retain the ethical and academic values and the purposes that lay at the foundation of higher learning. If together we all acknowledge that peace is not just a static condition, but an acting out of humanitarian ideal in everyday practice, perhaps peace has not only a chance, but a lasting future. I hope you will take this vision forward here today. Our friends and colleagues at the ASEAN Secretariat, CML, the ASEAN University Network, Asia Europe Foundation, and partners in Europe at the British Council, DAD, ENQA, and NUFIC have demonstrated the potential and commitment needed for lasting partnerships in higher education. Going forward, we hope to see more work in UNESCO's priority areas, including promoting inter-regional cooperation with partners in Africa. In May this year, UNESCO is preparing for a once in a decade gathering of global higher education community. The upcoming UNESCO World Higher Education Conference is an opportunity for the SHARE Consortium to promote lasting peace and send a message from Southeast Asia to partners worldwide. I hope your efforts over the next three days will include a renewed commitment to the SDGs and a call to action to promote positive peace. I believe higher education partnerships are central to that vision for sustainable development. And I believe your work is at the heart of higher education partnerships and that true partnership is our path to peace. Thank you. And I know that my colleague Libin, Hee-Jeon and Wesley are eager to engage with you as well. Together, you have UNESCO's full commitment to help transform higher education partnerships to achieve our shared goals. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Aoyagi, for sending us a warm opening remark from UNESCO Bangkok. Now, may I invite Dr. Sholatit Thiratiti, Executive Director of the ASEAN University Network, to give the next opening speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, His Excellency David Daly, uh, Mr. Shikaru Aoyaki, uh, Professor Dr. Sira Song Sivilai, MD, the Permanent Secretary, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rom Yen from Simil uh, Dr. Roger Chow from ASEAN, uh, uh, Dr. Wesley Tetter. Uh, who here from UNESCO as well. Uh, Mr. Darren McDermott, the Chair Program Team Leader. Uh, 
Distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Li Bing Wang, participants, ladies, gentlemen, um, with an increasing common experience we are all facing together during the global pandemic and with the realization that the forces of globalization are getting closer and closer to each and every one of us. Despite the talks of deglobalization, um, the talk of uh, realignment of the geopolitical uh, factors, partnerships, or more specifically, uh, strategic partnerships, will become more than a means to an end. We, I think, are all encouraged to participate in this three days share policy dialogue, particularly for the fact that this dialogue plays a variety of stakeholders in higher education in the same platform. On behalf of the ASEAN University Network or the AUN, I would like to express my appreciation to the organizer and co-organizers of this event, the SHARE program, the Education, Youth and Sports Division of the ASEAN Secretariat, Simil Rahit, and UNESCO Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education for getting us together today at a time when strategic partnerships are needed now more than ever before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sholatit, for a remarkable opening speech from the ASEAN University Network. And last but not least, may I invite Mr. Darren McDermott, Chair Program Team Leader, to deliver the last introductory remark. Thank you. Professor Sirug Song Sivalai, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Higher Education of Science, Research and Innovation of Thailand. His Excellency, Mr. David Daly, Ambassador of the European Union Delegation to, to Thailand. Dr. Romian Kosaikanont, Centre Director of Simeo Raihed, dear colleagues, friends and distinguished participants. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the 14th Share Policy Dialogue and the first to be held in hybrid form since the program began in 2015. We are delighted to be joining together with our many partners in the higher education sector from across Southeast Asia. And it's fitting that we hold our first in-person event in a very long time here in Bangkok, home to the headquarters of Simeo Raihed, UNESCO Asia Pacific Regional Bureau of Education and the ASEAN University Network. In that sense, the capital of Thailand is very much a center for higher education policy and practice in the region. In our discussions over the coming days, we'll look at the role of higher education in partnering with society at large in achieving the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This is timely because with just under eight years remaining to achieve the 2030 Agenda, the recent UN reports on the SDGs assert that progress remains uneven and we are not on track to meet the goals by 2030. Worse again, it seems that the pandemic has reversed years and in some cases, decades of progress. This means we need to redouble our efforts. It's important to look again at the SDGs as 17 interlinked goals rather than goals in and of themselves. Education and higher education are cross-cutting concerns that can impact multiple goals. Higher education partnerships with industry and civil society can address wider societal, regional, and international issues better than single sector initiatives. We hope you'll draw much from the forthcoming three days of discussions and join with us in reviewing and further developing international higher education partnerships with and for society at large. In collaboration with our partners, we look forward to bringing our learning from this policy dialogue to the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference in 2022 in Barcelona between the 18th and 20th of May. I would like to conclude by thanking our partners and friends in higher education in Southeast Asia and beyond 
for all they have contributed to making this policy dialogue possible. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you, Mr. Darren, for a powerful opening speech from Chair Program Team. And thank you once again to all the speakers for your blessings. In the next session, we will be hearing from our keynote speaker, Mr. Li Bing Wang, Chief of Section for Educational Innovation and Skills Development from UNESCO Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education. As a starter to our three-day dialogue, he will be sharing his views on the role of higher education partnerships in promotion of the goals. Please give Mr. Li Bing Wang a warm welcome on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, MC, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. This is Li Bing Wang from UNESCO Bangkok office. I, I, I'm sorry that I cannot join in person. Uh, but I'm not in, in the office uh, to, uh, to deliver a speech. Uh, dear Professor Sari Long, Song Zivilai, uh, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation of the Kingdom of Thailand. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. David Daly, uh, Ambassador of the European Union Delegation to the Kingdom of Thailand. Distinguished colleagues, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a good day to all of you. Let me uh, start by congratulating you on the opening of the 14th EU Share Policy Dialogue on the contribution of higher education partnerships in Southeast Asia towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. This meeting is very timely as UNESCO is collecting inputs to prepare for the Third World Conference, Higher Education Conference uh, to be held in Barcelona in May this year, your contributions and the voices are really important. I would like to thank the EU Share Program for initiating this policy dialogue and for bringing us together and evolving the major key international organizations in the region, including CMU Head, the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN University Network, as well as UNESCO. Indeed, this dialogue itself is a great example of the type of higher education partnerships in the region to promote the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. My brief talk will be divided into three parts. The first part will be on the Sustainable Development Goals themselves. At the turn of the century, uh, as you all know, the UN operational mechanisms changed from individual agencies dominated planning to a more UN-wide 15 years planning period. We already went through the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, for the first 15 years of the new millennium, and now we are nearing the halfway point of Agenda 2030, which covers the second 15 years of the millennium uh, until 2030. Compared to the eight international development goals, um, every aspect of our social life. The SDGs are also universal and applicable to all countries, regardless of their development patterns and stages. Therefore, the SDGs provide a common framework for national alignment and international referencing, as well as data collection and analysis to help support progress monitoring, gap identification, and the policy prioritization at national, regional, and global levels. The SDGs are internationally agreed development goals adopted in 2015 by all member states through the UN General Assembly. Unlike a convention, which is ratification based with legally binding status for all, for all parties, the SDGs do not require mandatory alignment from member states. However, national alignment and 
progress monitoring are highly encouraged in every member state. The level of engagement with the SDGs are different among countries in the region. Countries with stronger presence of UN agencies and international development partners can see more national alignment with the SDGs in their national planning and its imp their implementation processes, while those with decentralized systems are less evolved in the regional referencing and national alignment exercises. Second, about reorienting higher education in favor of the SDGs. Against this background of the SDGs, many higher education systems in the region have responded quickly with new SDG-friendly agendas to revamp their teaching and learning, research and social engagement and outreach activities. In the area of teaching and learning, there should be SDG-driven reflections on the existing learning programs offered by higher education institutions to identify gaps for improvement, including content and the pedagogy upgrading. SDG relevance should be one of the important quality indicators and it should be integrated into the program development and the cost planning tools of higher education institutions. Efforts should also be made to raise the awareness of teaching personnel about the SDGs and the relevant global targets and build their capacity to integrate SDGs into their teaching and learning practices. In the area of research, so for 17 SDGs and their respective targets have provided an overarching framework for governments in the region to review their research policies and priorities and increase public investment accordingly. The 17 SDGs has also served as a catalyst for higher education institutions to restructure their research priorities and make organizational reforms with more centers of excellence and centers of development to be based on interdisciplinarity to address the pressing issues pertinent to the achievement of the SDGs. In the area of social engagement and outreach, efforts should be made to encourage diverse community members and the stakeholders in the development and implementation of SDGs related learning programs offered by higher education institutions and other higher education providers. Communities can also provide venues for community-based learning and experiential learning importance of sustainable development could be organized, uh, including uh, via online platforms. Another important area of engagement with the community is to nurture sustainable entrepreneurship activities through joint incubation centers with local communities, as there are great potentials in this regard until the SDGs framework. The last area is really to, uh, uh, on the higher education partnership, uh, as you can see that to enable higher education to support the achievement of the SDGs. Partnerships are more important than ever before. They are key enablers, given the interconnected nature of global and local challenges, as well as the need to build a shared commitment towards a shared future. For higher education teaching and learning programs to be relevant to and aligned with the SDGs, higher education partnerships with communities, employers, industrial, professional bodies, civil society, and international organizations are essential in ensuring that learning programs are locally aligned, are globally aligned, and locally relevant. Partnership between higher education institutions and their local communities should be mutually beneficial. We need to recognize different ways of knowing and doing 
as a source of strength and sustainability. A deeper awareness of and partnership with our local communities and cities will help to transform our higher education sector itself. At the international level, uh, cross-border mobility remains important. Mobile students and professionals need to engage in SDG-related projects through different international partnership programs, including virtual mobility that leads to credits and can be integrated into regular learning programs. We are happy to see several good mobility programs operated by partners of this policy dialogue. For research, a joint efforts can also be made to promote a culture of research among higher education institutions in the region, which used to be more teaching oriented, especially a culture of research in areas that are SDG driven. There's a need to think of higher education partnerships uh, for research, which are based not only on, on SDGs, but also on localizing the SDGs in their national and the local context. As the supply and the demand sides uh, of research, uh, higher education institutions and industry should work together more closely to deliver tangible research results that can contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. There is a great potential for this region to establish more thematic research alliances among higher Uh, organizations active in higher education in this region. We all have a big role to play in this regard. For social engagement and outreach partnerships with governments, civil societies, uh, local communities and industry are of uh, pivotal importance to reach out to more people through uh, SDG advocacy, awareness raising, and capacity building and capacity strengthening activities. Of course, social engagement and outreach activities uh, have no national boundary. Cross-border collaborations and partnerships can bring together countries to learn from each other and empower each other in, a, in our common course towards, uh, towards the achievement of the SDGs. Um, in conclusion, uh, the SDGs are mainly related to content areas and perspectives that are cutting across the three main functions of higher education, which is teaching and learning, research, social engagement and outreach. Partnerships within the higher education system with external stakeholders as well as with international organizations can ensure that higher education institutions deliver results through the exercising of these three key functions. That's all for my humble understanding of the role of higher education partnerships uh, in the promotion of sustainable development goals for your consideration. I'm sure the topic is much broader than what I have shared. I'm looking forward to join the next sessions to learn from the experiences and the reflections of other speakers later. Thank, thanks again from UNESCO for your contributions and for the opportunity to share and learn. Thank you very much. Now back to you, MC.
And uh, I am asked to work on the main objective of this session, so I craft it a little bit differently. So this one is for our younger generation from Southeast Asia and ASEAN region to share their learning experiences and how the exchanges or three team projects have shaped their thinking and roles about work and life to lead the change for a sustainable development of the region. This is the world of true diversity. And you can see here, this is a hybrid session. And also the reflections will be from different programs by different generations as well. She is a gen, the Gen Y, very young Gen Y. And then we'll have a Gen Z coming up and also moderated by a Gen BB, baby boomer. So this is something very different and I think it should be very fun too. Now let me introduce our speakers to you and then let me start from the one very close to me because uh, we're here uh, at the site. Uh, the one who is with me here today is Miss Warawaran Yan Apa or Stan. We'll go by nicknames, okay? Because the full name is a little bit long for old lady to really remember. Now, she has got her technical and soft skills after studying in the Netherlands for one semester under the Share Mobility Program. Currently working as investment officer at the Bank of Thailand and will soon study in behavioral economics under the Thai government scholarship. Okay. Uh, I will ask you to speak first, but we still have three others waiting for us at the virtual backstage. So at this time, let me introduce three of them as well, and then they'll appear on the screen for us to see all the panelists, okay? I'll start by inviting Mr. Yi Teng Lo, Malaysian alum during his exchange to Mefa Lung University, Thailand, through the AIMS program. He's doing his final year. I think he should be the Gen Z, huh? Final year in conservation biology at the University of Malaysia, Sabah. And uh, following his experiences and passion, one definitely is on sustainable development goals. He founded a platform to promote cultural exchange and internationalization events. And he wants to introduce himself in Thai. I'll ask you to do it later, okay? Now, let us... Uh, Get to meet Mr. Yi Teng Lo. We can clap because um, virtually he's there. It's not a videotape, okay? The next one is uh, Mr. Tan Bora Sek, or Bora, current AUN awardee from the Royal University of Phnom Penh, working on an ASEAN master program in sustainability management at Gajamada University. He's keen on youth empowerment and sustainable economic development. Okay, let's meet Bora. We can clap. <laughs> Last but not least, Ms. Wasachon Narong Saksakun or Nan, alumna of ASEAN Foundations Empowering Youth Across ASEAN EYAA Program. Nan has been involved in several projects that contributed to SDGs. And since the nature of her project is very different, she will walk us through to get a better understanding of her project as well. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you have met all the panelists. Now, let me uh, tell you what to expect. Actually, we have some guided questions, but we are not strict as a stone, so they can really craft their own responses from their reflection. And some guiding questions are, what was the most valuable experience from the program that you participated? How do you link the experience with your work and life now and the future? How would you define sustainable region? So the younger ones may have something very different from my generation. How has experience shaped your thinking about sustainable region? And if you were to organize a new chapter of the program, what would be the first two things you think of and why? The session will be managed like this in two rounds. The first round will be 10 minutes. So they are very free to answer, to respond, to reflect, whatever they like to do. And, um, We'll have two minutes left for the second round. That will be really very brief and sweet for them to come up with some slogans, message, or even very short wording that will catch your ears and heart. So you can remember them and what they impress um, 
they were impressed by the participation. Okay. Now, all set. You ready? Okay, let me ask Satan to share your reflection first. Stan, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Stan. So, as Pitip has introduced me earlier, I graduated from Faculty of Economy, Jilangon University, and currently working as investment officer in Reserve Management Department, Bank of Thailand. So when I was in my third year in the university, I was awarded a chance to go study abroad for one semester in the Netherlands, the so University of Groningen. So basically what is EU share? EU share is the cooperation between European Union and ASEAN to support higher education and to enhance quality and regional competitiveness of the ASEAN student and institutions. So some of us were study intra-ASEAN, like going to Malaysia or Laos, but I choose to go to European Union. So from the experience, I would like to pick one or two stories that is a valuable experience for me. So firstly would be joining um, international student concert so it's not like i'm being the listener i'm being the singer so it's not weird for me to join a concert because i did it all the time when i was in bangkok but this was like the first time that i get to work with diverse people with diverse study background ages and nationality and of course it's not easy like i think i was the only person from ASEAN region and it's challenging to adjust myself to the Western culture way of working. I can say that they, unlike us, uh, unlike us Asians, they're quite straightforward and straight to the point. Sometimes it hurts a bit, you know, so much. Like I need to always keep in mind that it's not personal and we work towards the same goal. I think it's something that Thai students can learn from is, is that disagreeing not always ends up in fighting because Thai, we don't like to disagree with everyone, we just say yes. But if you do the disagreeing in a reasonable way, we can lead to a fruitful discussion and a great result. So from the experience, um, not only that I got a friendship, but I also got a soft skill to work with my future employers. Especially after graduation, I started working my first job with Essential Solutions. Uh, it's a multinational consultant firm. And my boss are uh, all are foreigners. And it's, it's a very challenging way to work with them. But I can say that the soft skill that I learned during my time abroad really helps me to strive there and work with them smoothly. So I think it's not academic skill that helps me. It's also the soft skill that I really treasure. So um, another thing that I would like to mention is that going abroad alone for the first time and traveling alone is something that made me grow personally. Like, I need to be independent and be decisive and resp uh, mostly responsible for my own actions. So it's not always an upgrade. I was cheated by a bike seller in Netherlands. I never really got that money back. It was, it was my, um, my own lesson that I think is something valuable. So to the sustainability, our theme today for me, sustainable regions means the cooperation of people and country in specific region to work towards one goal. It can vary depending on the regions because we all have different issues. Um, I think the concept of any country cooperation in the world is stronger together. And I think ASEAN, us, we still have room to leverage that. I think together we have the potentials to work towards that goal, especially the environment, because as you can see, ASEAN member countries' economic structure mostly relies on agriculturals. And our agriculturals activities was 
actually affected by global warming and such, and I see a lot of farmers in Thailand suffer. So um, I think that to work towards a sustainable goal, it can be a sensitive topic as when working together, one party might feel at last in a specific time, and why some country gain the benefit. So I think if we, in, uh, instead of looking at a short term, uh, our own to benefit, but more of like long term regional benefit, I think together we can work. And yeah, I think it's a, it will work out. So from the experience that I went to share um, to the Netherlands, uh, I think Netherlands is the country that you cannot miss out when talking about sustainable because Netherlands is really well known for water management. And despite being under the, uh, sorry, below the sea level, just like any country in ASEAN and Bangkok, definitely under sea level, they can manage flood and also manage to have enough water supply. Why in Thailand, for example, we have flood every year in the central regions and we still have drought in northeastern regions. So I think it's something that we can look after that, oh, sorry, look at them and then adapt to our own countries. Another thing that I think is really important, uh, really interesting from the Dutch is that they bike. They bike all day, they bike to everywhere, as you can imagine. But like many countries, including Thailand, have been trying to push in for bicycle as a means of transportation for a long time, but we still haven't succeeded. Why? I think there's something we can look at the Netherlands, the Dutch, what they have that makes a difference. So from my, uh, from my observations, firstly, is the facility. It's really convenient for them to bike anywhere with a connected bike lane. And there's tons of bike parking lots. And yeah, it's something that you can never find in Bangkok. I mean, I cannot imagine myself biking and not being scared of getting hit by a car. And secondly, I think it's also because they have a legal measurements. In Netherlands, the priority would be like, People come before bike and bike come before cars. So biker can feel assured that they're going to be safe. So it's all these little things that make me interested in the behavioral side of the society and how to influence people's behavior towards sustainability goals. Um, so for, for my experience, if I could go back to the past and tell something to myself, it would be be open and focus on the present. Sometimes we lose track of time and just worry about the future, just worry about the past, and then the present will be gone. And also for those who are going to exper uh, experience this kind of program again, I would suggest it, have a concrete goal in your mind, what you want out of the program. For example, it's not, it doesn't have to be something academic. For me, it can be like, okay, I'm going to learn 10 news menu during my time there, so I'm going to make 10,000 friends, not 10,000. <laughs> yeah, but because as I said, time flies, and when you're busy adjusting yourself in a new environment, you will never, at the end of the program, you will feel like, oh, I haven't accomplished anything. I haven't, nothing happened. So I think having a concrete goal can keep you on track. So if I would like to, if I have a chance to share my opinions on what could make SHARE program better, I would say that um, there's some event that SHARE can help. Like before the mobility, I think you can have alumni to talk to the awardees of that bash, like what to prepare, what, what can you expect it to face it during the time because some, for some of us, it's the first time that we get to go abroad. And during the time, during the mobility, maybe she could hold a, a meetup between students in the region so that we can share our thoughts and ideas and keep connections. And lastly, after share, I think we can still have like a, a project together. Just like, uh, if I remember correctly, wisely have a competitions that students can participate and present their project and the winner will get the uh, the funding to pursue their project so i think 
maybe we can have the sustainable goals, sustainable project. I usually, uh, actually, I even thought to do that with my friend share. It's a really great one. So that would be all of my for now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Kasatang. I think you have touched a lot of issues within a very short time. Uh, looking from personal objectives to the larger regional goals and the basic things that everyone needs to have is to have the shared goal if we want our region to be sustainable. And you have observed a lot of things. Again, when you think back to the region, it means different contexts different enforcement in some of the issues. And that is really very interesting. I also like it when you touch on what uh, the SHARE program will do, which may apply to other programs as well. You talk about the support system, the process that would help with a stronger network, and also how to adjust yourself. I also think that uh, one of the best things is that we are not talking only about the academic side because eventually you get the soft skills. And this is something that the private sector always complains, that our kids, after they graduate, they don't really have enough soft skills. So I think you have a lot more than others. And when you say you talk about two story, I said two true stories that you really had and gained as your personal experiences. And that is really very precious. Thank you very much. Now, on my list, the next one, Yi Tang. You ready? Yes. Okay. Yes, we did. Oh, yes, we okay. Did. So you want to introduce yourself in Thai first? Uh, I think yes. Okay. Yes. Ah, go ahead. Hey, the floor is yours. Okay. So am I audible? I think good, right? Is the background Fine. noise? Is the background noise too noisy? Okay, so let's start. Okay, it's fine, it's Lauren. So you can introduce yourself. So, what's up? So, what's up, Pom? So, what's up? So, what's up? Ti, Ajan, Ti, Pi, Nong, Nong, Ti, Ah, Gong Tep, Yao Go, Yao Go, Tu Kun, Tu Virtual Show, Ti, Ah, Hope Platform, Ini Ti Dai Yu Zap Kap. Okay, that's all. <laughs> My Thai already low. Okay, okay, so, salam sejahtera, mabuhai, and a very good afternoon to everyone. Whether you watch virtually from the uh, online platform or physically from Tap Thailand. So, sorry for uh, the background noise because I still, I am in restaurant actually. Okay, so I am, I have a general introduction of myself. I am Lo Yiteng or Yiteng, a student representative from Malaysia. Also the alumni of the AMS program, Asian International Mobility for Students program. So I'm in the batch of 2019 summer. I went for Mei Fa Luang University, Thailand for my exchange opportunities. So now I'm the final year student in conservation biology, studying in University Malaysia Sabah. Then now I'm doing my internship in the Innoprise Face Foundation's Rainforest Rehabilitation Project in FAPRO under Yayasan Sabah Group in Malaysia. So actually I just in the forest. <laughs> I, I just I, today I just <laughs> today I just move out from the forest just for this event then I will go back to forest later on. <laughs> so yeah it's just a brief introduction of me. So I continue with the uh, Asian International Mobility for Students program which is AMS. Actually AMS is a program where AMS to create a vibrant student mobility program for citizens of all Siamo member uh, members country. So around Asian country, we can just send the students go uh, from, like from Malaysia. I go, uh, I went to Thailand for my exchange. Then they will send this 
from Thailand, they will send the students to Malaysia. So it's just an exchange program, also the exchange for students. Then the students can get the credit transfer via the programs. Okay, so we continue. I think I have one video I sent to the organizer. You may share it maybe after or during, during this, my presentation. Okay. So what was the most valuable experience from the AMPs that I have participated? I think I can conclude in five words. Encourage, expose, explore, experience, engage. First, encourage. Encouragement, I need to encourage myself to join the mobility program. Then how I start the story with AMPs. Then learn to be independent to survive in the host country. This is first. Second, expose. I expose with various culture and people. It not only like improve my knowledge of culture sharing, also is improve my worldview. So I can see the world in the larger view in the more a different perspective. Also, it enlarge my social circle. Third, explore. Explore the new opportunities and the knowledge transfer. Just uh, for your information, I used to be the model of the Mayor Falun University to promote to promote for the international students field. So there was a, another great exposure that I have experienced through my mobility programs. Okay, so next the experience, experience the culture difference and know the do and don'ts of the foreign people. So when we know their culture, then we can easily interact with them. Other than we do some things that they will do like some silly things to them, uh, like see the silly things to them. But when we know their culture, it will be like, wow, surprisingly, you know that everything. Then the, the last one will be engage. Engage with the locals, new friends, and and the foreign friends that I know in the in in the programs. So even until now, I still keep in touch with them. Like we can have a simple meet up in the and now in the uh, Google Meet or Zoom to share our daily activities. It just very um, for me. It's very exciting. So I have all a lot of this uh, a lot of friends from all other countries. So, how do I link the experience with my work and my life and now in the future? So, actually, after I come back from Mayfalong University, I start helping the university in call as student bodies to help to assist the international students or mobility students, especially M students, in uh, they survive in my in my country. So, I just I just help them to do for. Uh, I just do what from I learned from the uh, student bodies in Thailand, then I use it and then apply back to Malaysia. Then after that, I see there's another opportunity for me. Then I start with my working page, it's called Rakun. Then what is the meaning of Rakun in Thai? Then it means love you, which means uh I, for me, it just want to spread love and joy. So when the students welcome, uh, when we welcome the students in for love and joy, so they will feel that this is a second home for them. So that's how Raccoon started. So it promotes the internalizations and the global engagement through the education, art, culture sharing, which in line with the sustainable development goals for quality education and the sustainable development goal 17, Partnership for goals. So this is how I continue my internalizations with the locals and the global communities. Then how I move it to become the global citizenship. Then how you I how I define the sustainable region. Region is mean a place. A sustainable is mean continuously and make it persist forever in all shape. So we just con uh, it just bring all the things, then make it continuously, then share, like, we, like I used to change our culture. Then after I change my culture, I bring all the ASEAN uh, countries' culture to uh, another people. So when the culture sharing is keep 
upgrading, then you will, people will get to know you and get to know ASEAN culture. So how has the experience shaped your thinking about sustainable regions that I said? A small change make a big impact. Don't underestimate the change that you have done. So even we, we just don't use the plastic bag, it can, it can have a big impact to our earth. Same goes to the sustainable regions. We can just make link with all the all countries' friends. So make this world become more peace and more harmonious. Okay. So different because different people have their own background, then be the global citizen, we need to concern and care not only our our countries matter, but all the world all around the globe. So we can maximize the value of each object and make everything possible. How would I tell you in the past? For me, actually I thank you myself when I joined for the AMS program. Even I thank you for this mobility program. I able to attend before the pandemic starts. So after the pandemic, I stay, I, I go back to my home university. So just one, be courage and to face every challenge because it prepare you for a brighter future. Sometimes it has some thoughts for you to give up, but then sustain your dreams and pursue it, achieve it will make your life no regrets. So the last question, if I have the chance to organize a new chapter of AMS program, there is two things I will do. First, I want to extend the AMS family so that more university can be included and more students can join the join these mobility programs. Then another one will be actually same with just now, make the Abdunai talk so that the peoples will not fear, will not fear to join the mobility program. They just step out from their comfort zone and become the global citizen. And yeah, I learned a lot from this mobility program. I even interact with Laos, peoples, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, then Korea, United States, France. So it's, it's many countries that I can, you can learn from them and then make your social circle more complicated and make you an, another global citizen. Thank you. I couldn't really pronounce it when I read your bio. Now I know what the meaning it is and it's really very valuable because it's from your heart. And uh, you only mentioned credit transfer once, but after that, you were talking about soft skills and then some of the precious experiences. Plus, right now you are using the e-communication for your e-friendship. And also look, really look beyond yourself. I like it best when you say, I thank myself. And that's one of the things that you learn that for the next chapter, then people have to get out of their comfort zone. I call it a buy box because in Thailand, everything is a buy, right? So you just climb out of your buy box and then uh, try to meet other people. Uh, this, this is really, really nice. I think uh, the organizers have a lot to learn and then from the good practices, we can craft the new program much better. Thanks so much. Now, Bora, you ready? You go next and uh, your reflection, something that we are looking forward to hearing from you. Bora, you have the floor. Right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank everyone, including the SHARE team, for arranging uh, this dialogue today. And I think all of the uh, panelists uh, before me already like covered everything that I uh, want to say. But uh, I'll try my best to uh, give some, uh, some more insight into the discussions. So uh, yeah, uh, my name is Chan Bora. I'm originally from Cambodia. And I did uh, my bachelor degree in international relations at the uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh. And uh, right now I'm uh, actually uh, residing in a 
beautiful, beautiful city of uh, Yogyakarta in Indonesia, uh, doing uh, my master, um, my master in a program called ASEAN Master in Sustainability Management, uh, which is a scholarship program that is uh, funded by the uh, Norwegian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in collaboration with the uh, ASEAN University City Networks and with um, University of uh, Gajamada and the University of Edgar. And this program is uh, created with the purpose to um, foster a young, young leader that could help try to uh, strengthen the environmental sustainability uh, through uh, rigorous and uh, rigorous solid economics and development model that could help uh, focus on the long-term values and the long-term purpose that uh, the world actually needs. And um, yeah, uh, so uh, what is like the, the most uh, valuable experience from this program so far to me? Um, uh, to me, actually, the program is uh, allow me to uh, become more critical toward the uh, current uh, business environment, which has uh, a huge role to play in in regard to uh, moving uh, toward a sustainable, sustainable development. While at the same time, um, this experience, uh, instead of trying to uh, uh, allow us to focus on short-term uh, profits, but it, but this program allows us to, to focus on pro, uh, pro, uh, long-term profit-oriented and shareholder value, which is uh, more sustainable to what the environments and social. And um, at the same time, the program is uh, trying to install um, a sustainable leadership mindset uh, to me and the rest of uh, other master candidate by giving us the, uh, the exposure um, uh, with uh, outstanding uh, lecturer, facilitator and guest lecturer who have like uh, extensive experience in uh, leading sustainable businesses and a company uh, across uh, ASEAN. And another valuable experience from the program is the, it actually uh, is the, the ability for me to meet with different ASEAN members uh, especially ASEAN uh, students who's coming from eight different ASEAN countries and learn from the experience working uh, with grassroots uh, community, uh, businesses, governments, and social enterprise and how uh, they help solve uh, social problems using uh, different tools and techniques that they have been uh, doing in their own country. And uh, next question is quite tough for me of, of how, it's, uh, how the program is linked with uh, my spin of uh, my works and my life between now and the, the future. But yeah, before this uh, master program, uh, I feel like uh, the world is actually on fire because of the environmental problems and the climate change uh, happen as a result of uh, uh, human's activity and human uh, consumption. And I was uh, actually uh, very uh, frustrated of my lack of knowledge and strategy and how I could try to help contribute to solve this uh, social problem. But then I got uh, an opportunity to uh, this uh, master program which it uh, make me right now become more uh, conscious of my own consumption and my own uh, daily activity uh, as I'm uh, right now trying to uh, reduce my own uh, carbon footprints while at the same time trying to integrating all of the knowledge, tools and strategy that I have that I've learned and accumulated during the master program into the works and the projects that I will be uh, doing later as I'm approaching uh, the end of my master program. And another question in regard to sustainable region. Yeah, this one is a really interesting question. So I would like to uh, first of all try to define what is sustainable region. So sustainable region is as a region that has like a strong focus on a sustainable economic uh, development model, where a regional player are competing and collaborating for a common uh, prosperity, uh, which enable uh, everyone in the region to achieve a uh, long-term growth. Uh, without uh, trying to uh, undermining uh, social envir and environmental impacts. And it is to uh, and to achieve uh, the re uh, sustainable regions, uh, each regional uh, player must focus on shareholder value and focus on the new ways of uh, conducting um, regional uh, businesses and, and commerce uh, with a strong focus on ESG and uh, uh, putting planets people and profits on the same accounting calculations. So uh, this is uh, of how I define as, as sustainable regions. And from my point of view, um, I think ASEAN as a region could become a sustainable region if uh, all of the leader put their, I would say, put their money where their, their mouth is, especially when it comes to uh, 
uh, sticking with their own commitments in regard to ASEAN uh, Vision 2025 20, uh, and beyond. And um, uh, the next question in regard to uh, how the experience shapes my uh, thinking about the sustainable region. So I see a regional uh, integration and cooperation uh, more important than ever, especially in these uh, times of uh, uncertainty. So in order to transform a region into a sustainable region, it needs a greater uh, regional uh, cooperation from different stakeholders and from the government and uh, from public and private sector as well as from a civil society organization to come together and to try to um, uh, find solution to solve this uh, social environmental problem and try to build uh, a, a strong regional guidelines and framework to uh, facilitate a new business opportunity that focus on long-term uh, interest as a mean to um, make our region more competitive and sustainable in the, in the long run. I think, um, and then the last question, if I have to uh, give suggestion of how to organize a new program. Uh, to me, I, uh, I, I think that um, I would focus more, stress more on program related to uh, leadership and social entrepreneurships, uh, because ASEAN right now is one of the regions uh, with the increase in youth populations and uh, rising in human uh, resources. And I think uh, therefore a leadership related program uh, is very important as it allows youth the opportunity to uh, grow their leadership mindset and to have like a strong emphasis on sustainable developments and entrepreneurial mindset, which focus on problem solving, uh, on a, a business idea that can help solve social environmental problem and uh, try to build a com competitive edge for the region. And uh, before I end my discussion, I would like to uh, end with a personal uh, message. So, um, my message is I would like to um, say that uh, right now, ASEAN needs uh, young people because ASEAN as a whole has a huge potential to become a, a big regional uh, and global player because um, especially in shaping the uh, global economic landscape towards sustainability. And therefore, as a young leader of ASEAN, it is our duty to create a common vision and purpose that can uh, help make this uh, ambitious to become uh, a, real, a reality and um yeah uh, and a program like share just uh, did and other program related is like a step into the uh, the right direction to uh, grow a young leader of asean so uh this is the end of my discussion thank you so much Thank you very much. Bora, you said whatever you wanted to say was said. Actually, you have a lot more. And uh, I was about to say that if all you wanted to say was said, that means you are confirming what they said is right. But you have done a lot more. And I love when you talk about leadership, especially for the young leaders, for our region to continue growing and not just for now but for the longer term goals so that is really nice let me go to nan last but not least uh you have powerpoint to present as well and let's hear from her and uh, we'll go briefly to the second round okay right after this nan please so thank you pt for your thank kind you. introduction Greetings to all participants. It's my great pleasure to speak on behalf of my team at the 14th Share Policy Dialogue. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the Share Organizing Team and ASEAN Foundation for having me here today. I'm Vasa Shonarong Saksakun, an alumna of Empowering Youth Across ASEAN Program, organized by the ASEAN Foundation, partnering with Maybank. I'm a lecturer in DLT, materials uh, writer, and Google certified educator from Thailand. I have been involved in several projects that contributed to SDG, namely identified identity supported by the U.S. Department of State and GoGo Close supported by UNESCO FCU and the Ministry of Education of Republic of Korea. My most recent project implemented with my team in Taito. Student Memorable Academic Enrichment under the Empowering Youth Across ASEAN program. Please go on to the next slide. Now I'm going to introduce you to another project-based learning program with a few slides. Project SMAS was initiated by the youth change maker from across six ASEAN member states, contributing to sustainable development goals, namely Goal 1, 
no probity. Goal three, good health and well-being. Goal four, quality education. And goal 10, reduce inequalities. Let's go on to the next slide. DMs to further quality education, a healthy lifestyle and sustainable livelihoods to eradicate the local community suffering from mercury due to a small scale gold processing in Sakatong, Indonesia. This pilot project implemented from October to December 2021 in line with our civic society organization, our CSO, Nexus 3 Foundation's existing STEAM SHIM program is considered of four key activities targeting 30 junior high school students as follow. First, English lesson in which ecological child rights of ECR and environmental themes are incorporated. Second, an educational video contest related to ECR environmental issues. Third, teacher training on the use of the educational technology in English language classroom. And finally, book donation drive for the school library. Now I'll walk you through our change maker's journey. Next slide, please. We used to the idea that public, private, and nonprofit organizations are separate spheres. The program has demonstrated how we as youth volunteers can transform ourselves and society. This program has a set of vivid examples of youth intervention in the shift of the ASEAN region. We firmly believe this will be a transition in perception of the power of the new generation. Our independent youth projects were implemented under four themes, including arts and culture, community empowerment, environmental diversity, and education to serve the local community across ASEAN. We would like to highlight how the program has positively impacted approximately 20,000 individuals and 59 engaging NGOs and partners through solid collaboration and partnership. We might be familiar with volunteerism, which generally takes place on site. When this has been online due to the pandemic, it can be assumed that carrying it out behind the screen would minimize our opportunities to interact with other participants and stakeholders. Conversely, thanks to the technology, this excellent program exposes us to our steps of systematic preparation exercise from thought-provoking virtual discussions and enriching share and learn sessions among volunteers via Zoom. One-on-one -on -one team coaching by Sustain, an ASEAN Foundation organizing partner, offers a chance to go beyond our limits by shaping our essential skill for project management and enhancing our learning journey during the training period from August to October 2021. We initially consider what specific skills and experience we require from the matching phrase, which facilitates us to see a clear sense of our self-perception from our lens. Then we carefully review the CSO profiles and their existing projects suitable for fulfilling either our personal or professional needs. After that, we propose a comprehensive individual plan to support our target organizations. In the final phrase, our team planned the project together on Tero, an online tool that our team agree on for our virtual project management. It means establishing the goals of our project, its scopes, deliverables, including our tax allocation, timelines, and budget. Traditionally, face-to-face -face interaction is required to generate ideas, build relationships, and facilitate collaborations at the team. In that time, hundreds of millions of people worldwide have lived through lockdowns, and we were one of those. Therefore, it was all about hybrid way of working, by learning to accomplish our assessment remotely without significant drop in productivity or quality, as well as maintaining our mental health and well being. It was such an honor to be nominated from approximately 2,000 applicants to participate in the program. Again, a sense of achievement and satisfaction in my role as a secretary of Project SMART. I equipped myself in education as a lecturer in English to excel mainstream education and English training, which is my best interest. Previously, I was involved in numerous professional related projects, primarily curriculum development and student activities. However, it was predominantly within the territory level. Based on my online volunteering experience, Project SMART was incomparable to my regular works project. When our proposal was submitted for review, I learned to be flexible and open to any suggested modification. I believe that there was more room for me to learn uh, from our 
lovely CSO and other team member whose expertise is extensive in humanitarian approach to education. What makes this program unique was our opportunity to contribute collaboratively with the three CSO from Nexus 3 Foundation. This is the first time broadening my horizons by genuinely engaged with the local community outside Thailand. I gain a wealth of practical knowledge to implement this sustainable project in action and build social and cultural competencies by promoting ECR within English capacity and encouraging the students to think globally and act locally. Sustainable, sustainable development goals and global skills have gained attention in today's world education. This can be incorporated in English language teaching in preparation for entering higher education. I develop myself deeper into methods and techniques in which both language and other subjects have a joint role. By doing so, students are well equipped with essential skills, a knowledge and attitudes to be future ready citizens supporting Thailand and Asians transition to competency based education. I'm convinced uh, to assist my student colleagues and acquaintance in seeking volunteering opportunity that we have multiple positive uh, benefits for volunteer. Um, the organization and the wider community consequently we better prepare for changes is mark a start of transforming ourselves, our careers and life. The ASEAN region has a third of youth population projected to reach over 220 million by 2038. There's a growing recognition of fully integrated young generation perspectives in the regional development and enhance their participation in community building in social processes. The ASEAN social cultural community can be considered a significant pillar concerning the goals set by the ASEAN Vision 2020, which indicate a South uh, is ASEAN born together in partnership and founded a common regional identity. Our alumni cooperation in education is a crucial strategy for enhancing human resources, alleviating poverty from socioeconomic disparities and ensuring economic growth with equity. In addition, the need for Southeast Asian to be established at a regional gateway based on the biocircular green economy model and increase the demand for skill level in ASEAN adaptation of applicable technologies for sustainable market. I'm certain that our professional knowledge of Southeast Asian educators should be redefined in a broader sense, not include what happened in the classroom, but also the wider context for student skill uh, enhancement. Action for development is urgent to validate learning gain outside from formal education in workplace in support of learners' regional mobility because of present knowledge and skill that are mismatched with the actual market demand. According to the 2030 Agenda, go for quality education is fundamental right. Access to education and lifelong learning should be a priority. This advantage group in rural areas in Sakadong needed an active youth involvement with a social sectors. Um, the solution line with ASEAN Youth Volunteers, our CSO, SMP and 2 school, including principals, teachers, administrators, and students. And of course, the Indonesian Education Agency committed to assessing quality education and bridging the digital divide more equitably. Our collaboration ensure its workforce is prepared for benefit from economic integration by investing more resources for primary and secondary education to STEAM which is an approach to teaching and learning that combines science, technology, engineer, arts, and maths to guide student inquiry, discussions, and problem solving, resulting in an increase in active citizen, job creation, and social protection. From our online volunteer perspective, the shift is massive and unconsequential. Although we weren't able to experience the essence of being in contact on site, we have successfully assisted the local community in striving for new options by visualizing how they would like to live and creating new expectations about lifestyle choices, working condition, and life balance. In my view, empowering youth across ASEAN is well planned and directly suits my professional development needs as an educator. From my curriculum development and training perspective, youth capacity building programs offered across ASEAN are able to refer to the newly established ASEAN um, qualification reference framework. 
Youth Training by Design has a possibility to be accredited and offered as a micro-credential based on each ASEAN member state's national qualification system. It will benefit the participants' recognition against the other or re regional qualification framework and inter-regional recognition to promote the free flow of skill level in terms of harmonization and standardization. Furthermore, this transition uh, makes educational qualification more relevant to industry demand by raising education quality and making qualification transparent and comparable across national borders. The referencing to the regional framework, we also increase the involvement of stakeholders in communication about the skills required by industry, educational institution, government agency partners, and sponsor. Despite the fact that this is still work in progress in Thailand, uh, by the office of uh, the office of the education council in collaboration with the Professional Quality Institute. And that would be my reflection. Thank you very much, Nan. This is really very rich in content. And then people are asking for your PowerPoint as well. I believe that we can share the PowerPoint to others because throughout the journey, there are a lot of things that people want to pick up along the way. And this is tr a truly learning journey that is really very beautiful. I also, I don't know if other pick up, but I really like it when you mention mental health which is very important for us today and tomorrow world that is getting more complicated. Now, because uh, our time is limited, I, we have only nine minutes left. So we'll go to the second round. Brief, sweet, touching. Okay, let's start from Stang. What will be your words, statements, message, slogan that you'd like to share? Uh, maybe just a quick slogan for SHARE program. Maybe you want to use it later. <laughs> if it's good, yeah. it might not be good. Okay, so just like um, share your world, expand your view with SHARE program. Oh, okay. And then you have to go with this gesture as well. Huh? <laughs> Great. Okay. Yi Cheng? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For me, as post, as pro, experience, make global citizens, make us connected. Great. Wow. Okay, we have quite a few touching ones for us to work on. Okay, the next more, Bora. Um, uh, to me, I think uh, my last word is, uh, in order to achieve something greater, especially a, a sustainable development, it needs uh, collective actions to achieve that. Thank you. Okay, collective actions. All right, great. Nan. Um, I'd like to end with a quote by Madama Gandhi. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the services of others. Oh, okay, that is so nice. Okay, then let's go to some of the, the comments and questions, okay? Uh, I think... Uh, we have this one so nice to see the youth for this dialogue okay great nice to see all congrats okay anyone wants to touch on this one what role universities can play in the achievement of sdg wow anyone wants to try answering this question anyone at all from Maybe your I could try, uh, quickly yeah, I, I think, was thinking uh, about SDG you is like, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, I think to me, in general, SDG is still a, a new concept to many uh, people, especially in ASEAN. So I think the best way to uh, for university to play a role right now in order to uh, accelerate SDG is to actually integrate SDG study or general knowledge of what is SDG to uh, to students. So that way, they could start with the basic of what is fundamentally sustainable development goal. Thank you. Okay, so Thank this you. should become a 101 course in all the universities, if not covering the orientation as well, okay? So people get to know. All right. I like this one, so I really want to show this. Youth participation is source of motivation, okay? So they are very happy to see all of you here. Good sharing session. 
fruitful sharing now. I'm looking for some questions here. Uh, okay, this is a long one. Okay. How can SDG partnerships help the micro, small, and medium enterprises of the different ASEAN nations? Do you have any activities currently being done by higher education that have SMA, M, MSMEs as the beneficiaries? Most specifically, they are the ones mostly affected by the pandemic. The question. Um, Bora, you were talking about business. You want to touch a little bit because I think this issue we can ask a second, uh, the, the next session to answer to. Anything, Bora, right. and any uh, other? Yeah, uh, through my, uh, I think through my experience in general, I haven't seen like university focus uh, on uh, SDG partnership with uh, SME yet, but I see the, the growing roles of government, especially uh, in, in my context, the uh, Cambodian government, they actually have to uh, create their own uh, social enterprise uh, institution to work with a uh, small and medium uh, uh, businesses who uh, have uh, actually have a, a business that sells social, that solve a social problem, like especially entrepreneur who uh, use a recycled product and turn it into a, a new product that we can use later, for example, uh, uh, right straw or reusable um, uh, sanitation pad or something. So this is uh, this is what uh, the role of government has been doing toward SME. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Nan, do you have anything to add? Um, actually, there's some teams um, that they were working on the small size, medium enterprise, but it's not my team. But we have um, several teams that working on that in Cambodia and um, in Malaysia from our program. Uh, I see. I think um, there are a lot of projects available here and there, but we don't really know where and how they exist. So this is one of the ways that we have to help spread the word if we happen to know about any other activities and also some of um, the awards and projects can really uh, look into this stuff as well. Uh, I'd like to... Oh, uh, this has been recorded, right? So uh, some people really want to revisit them later. Okay, I'd like to say this. This one... Awesome. Congratulations to all of you. Your experiences, your ideas are very interesting. We have three minutes left. So what I'd like to conclude is that we have various experiences from different programs. And actually, there are some common features that we can use across all the programs and awards. Some Something like share purpose, share goal, uh, something like continuous efforts to really look into what we want to do in the future together, particularly for the youth, the young leadership that we need to do. We also talk about, um, actually Nan has touched on the very good one about project management in the teamwork way. Some of the things that will team our region together and then go forward more collectively. And this will be very precious for us to go along this regional journey together for sustainability. So let me conclude by thanking all of you on the panel and all of you here and virtually somewhere in the world. Thank you.
Many thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this next session on partnerships with the private sector and civil society for the goals. My name is Darren McDermott. I'm the team leader of the SHARE program and moderator for this session. So I'm really pleased to be joined by an excellent keynote speaker and a diverse panel from across the intersection of higher education, the private sector, and civil society to explore how higher education partnerships with the private sector and civil society can contribute to innovative, dynamic, future-oriented learning experiences, preparing learners for the changed world of work while being active global citizens in a sustainable world. First, I'd like to go to our keynote speaker, and he is Mr. Krenkrai Yuyuen, People Partnership Director at B. Grimm. B. Grimm is a large multinational conglomerate, a large and very old multinational conglomerate, conglomerate founded in 1878 with divisions in healthcare, energy, building and industrial systems, real estate, e-commerce, and transport. Kriankrai has completed his Bachelor of International Relations at Thammasat University with a first-class honors and holds a Master in Labor Economics from Chula Longhorn University. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the, the policy dialogue today, Krenkrai. Uh, I know you're, you're in Thailand, but you're joining us online. Uh, so over to you and look forward to your keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kapswadi Kap. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's very, it's been my honor to share uh, our practice uh, of doing business with compassion here at Big Rim. Uh, my name is Krenkrai, People Partnership Director of Big Rim. Yeah. Uh, beginning with my department, my department's name, uh, People Partnership, actually it is uh, People Office, but uh, between we would like to emphasize on a partner with uh, all stakeholders. So uh, we, we set up our department name uh, to be People Partnership. So my position is a People Partnership Director. This name is reflect our priority of uh, working toward the way of collaboration and uh, ecosystem for success, not only business, but also uh, people management. Excuse me, uh, I have to share a slide, right? I'm sorry. Okay. So I hope everyone see my slide. Okay, so um, back to uh, 1878 or 144 years ago, 
uh, Big Green was found as the modern medicine importer. Uh, we are the group that built Thailand infrastructure, such as uh, Rangsit Canal. As you know, uh, Rangsit Canal is the largest infrastructure project in Southeast Asia over 100 years ago. And uh, Big Green as the uh, being the, an instrument force in creating the telegram that we use in the past. Until now, we diversify our business, aligning, aligning with a fast-moving world. We have energy, as you know, and uh, we try to be uh, creating eco-friendly power sources. We try to create innovations and also uh, another business like healthcare and digital solutions. So for now, currently, uh, we, have six, we have six business units under the grim, comprising of industrial, uh, healthcare business. We also have lifestyle, uh, capital investment, digital, and uh, the last one which everyone recognizes us is power business. Uh, our philosophy is doing business with compassion for the development of civilization in harmony with nature. So we are not focusing only on uh, revenue or our business profit, but our goal is uh, the growth of the society and also the environment. This is uh, Mr. Halaling, our president and chairman. And uh, I select this quote because uh, this is my favorite quote from him. Uh, which reflect what we do and what is our purpose to do this business. He always mentioned that um, in addition to building successful businesses, we have always aimed to create positive social impact to our business model, focusing on the needs of people and our environment. Business need to pioneer change responsibly by caring for humans, the environment and their welfare. After all, business exists for and because of them. So this is the code that I, I, I like and uh, made me uh, make decision to join BigBrim at that time. So to uh, recap the BigBrim to everyone again, uh, we are 1.8 billion US dollar company which has over 4,200 customers around, uh, I think, 12, uh, 12 countries and we have a uh, 2,800 employees. So uh, 144 years, what make us being here until today? Uh, this is the key factors that uh, I think uh, it make us be here 144 years already. So we have our own way of working or culture. We call it uh, Big Rim DNA, comp comprising of four P's. The first P is uh, positivity. We emphasize on people well-being, uh, both mental and physical. And we are trying to promote mindful compassion uh, as one of our working tools. The second P is uh, professionalism, that uh, everyone are, uh, we believe that everyone has expertise uh, with ability and resilience to deal with the business. The third P is a pioneering spirit. This is the this is the original way of working since we found uh, last 144 years ago, and now we are moving forward to accelerate uh, growth with innovation. And the last P, I think, is very important to be grim. That is uh, partnership. So uh, talking about partnership. I could say that uh, this is the uh, key success of Big Grim. Uh, we can walk, actually we can walk by ourselves, I believe, to do the business, but uh, we don't. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, together is more. So every investment we always seek for the partner to do with us. For example, um, business partner, we have over 40 peers in the industry to collaborate and partner with us. For power business, we have our big friend like uh, Amata, uh, 
uh, WHA, uh, Bangladesh Industrial Park. We have uh, Sing Estate and Asia Industrial Estate. For the smart energy, smart city project, we have SCG, Assign Cement Group, DT Green, Sarapat, and True. For LNG import partner, we have PTT LNG to support us. And we also have an uh, industrial unit in the, in the industry estate as our value customers. For the public sector, we work closely with uh, ECAT, uh, Metropolitan Electric City Authority or NEA, and uh, Provincial Electric City Authority or uh, PEA for seamless providing utilities and power supply. And lastly, for developing the education, uh, new generation workforce, talent, new business model, we have uh, GIC and Harbor Space for uh, innovation company. Uh, we also collaborate with uh, top Thai universities as our partner for creating the opportunity for students and uh, share our practice to develop society knowledge on uh, our activities. So now and uh, in the nearly future, we are confronting with these four challenges. Uh, decarbonization, we aim to be net zero carbon emission company by uh, uh, 2070. For disruption and digitization, we are going to transform our company to uh, innovation company with our partners. For diversity, we care and always focus on diversity and, in and inclusion as our policy. So uh, I think this will not impact to the, uh, this will impact to the future of work, which uh, uh, everyone uh, here, uh, executive uh, to run the business and people should aware and uh, focus uh, are recruiting the right workforce uh, develop them with the right skill, uh, retain the talent, engage people with well-being and happiness, and also create the ecosystem for sustainable growth of the society, which we always do as the Big Green Partner way. So end of my presentation today. So thank you very much, everyone. and interesting philosophy uh, of, of business and we look forward to, to following uh, the activities of, of B Grimm uh, and, and your partnerships uh, as we go on. So thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So I'd now like to move to the panel uh, component of, of this session uh, and we have a, a really interesting and diverse panel. Uh, today. Joining us in Bangkok is Ms. Aum Patanatai, the CEO of Generation Thailand. Joining us online, uh, also I, I believe in, in Thailand, is Dr. Virat Chirapadnanakul. My sincere apologies if I've butchered your name. Um, <laughs> he is the no managing worries. director and co-founder of Schooldio uh, Thailand. Joining us virtually, uh, from Kuala Lumpur is Dr. Haja Yatila Zainal Abedin, CEO of Yayasan Saim Darby, Malaysia. And also with us in Bangkok is Mr. Bob Fox, uh, Vice President, European Association for Business and Commerce, or Eurocham, Eurocham Thailand. First up is Aum from Generation Thailand, who's over 10 years' experience in the education and international development field both at the policy and grassroots level. And prior to joining Generation Thailand, she worked with Right to Play uh, and using sport and play to protect, educate, and empower vulnerable children and youth across Thailand and beyond. Before that, she led a dynamic team, at our partner, Simia Raihead, serving ministries of higher education in 11 countries in Southeast Asia. Um, thanks again for joining the Share Policy Dialogue and over to you to tell us more about your work. Sure. Um, thank you, Darren. And should I control this myself, or is it someone controlling? Um, I believe you, the, oh, okay. the team can, can give you a hand. All right. Yeah. Um, really happy to be here, to be in the um, 
family and I also like enjoy um, joining the share policy dialogue every time depending on which role I am. So thank you very much all the hosts for uh, having uh, me. And now that I'm using a different hat, I'm now with the organization called Generation, um, Generation Thailand. And I would like to uh, introduce, if you uh, joined the policy dialogue uh, previous one, you might heard about uh, generation already. But this time I will go a little bit deeper on how we work in partnership with the uh, uh, other sectors, including the higher education sector as well. Um, when we talk about the SDG goals, which is the main thing uh, that we are focusing on, goals eight is on the decent work and economic growth and one thing that is um, stand out is definitely on the um, job creation which is the key and at Generation we our mission is definitely to transform education to employment uh, especially changing the system we prepare um, we place and support people into life changing career um, which uh, that would otherwise inaccessible and we have the methodology that um, serving many people that are unemployed and not just unemployed, underemployed as well. And the people who are with the need to learn the new, new skills. And you can see the two key players, which is employers. Uh, we serve employers and then we closing gap and provide the uh, career impact for the learners. For generation, we actually was quite new compared, compared to Be Grim before, which is like um, being in Thailand for a long time. Generation has just launched actually in 2015. Uh, we launched by McKinsey and Company in America. And because at that time we are all, all over the world, we see that the gap between uh, the graduates and, and trying to find a job and the employer also seeking for the right uh, talent um, still there. So it started McKinsey launch, and then we spin off as the uh, our own nonprofit uh, social organization. And in the past, we are focusing only for the youth, and which is the re recent graduate. When the COVID nineteen happened, we saw the need that um, we saw the disruption. COVID happened, people lost jobs. So we have a new program called Regeneration as well, and and focusing on the mid career and emphasize on the lifelong learning. And even though we are young, we expand quite fast. So now we are in 17 countries. In Thailand, we just launched uh, last year, actually, and start everything full string this year. Um, globally, we serve uh, about 50,000 uh, graduates already. And we try to emphasize a lot on um, women and also people with dependent. Uh, our, we also work with the more than 5,000 plus plus um, employers, partners um, from different sectors, startup, SME, and also the big conglomerate as well. People that join our program, 82% uh, can get job placement um, within three months and also have the uh, data tracking that three to four times earning more than before they're joining and also uh, 84 percent um, are doing better than the peer compared to um, this is the this is the uh, data that we get from the employers and we have current um, currently offer about 29 to 30 profession across the sector so we provide our curriculum or trainings um, in the tech industry we we provide on healthcare we have on the skill traits and also we provide uh, have the role on the customer service and sale as well and when i said training uh, we don't our aim for generation we don't just train to train our aim is um to place and make sure that people are employed so generation um if to say it easy way we like bridging the gap between the employers and the individual uh all of our learners we don't have um we don't have requirement so as long as they are 18 they can join. They don't have to have a background uh, or a degree or certificate or whatsoever uh, before joining, but we ensure that they can get into the uh, profession that they are looking forward. So we have, um, after we get the learner, we provide what is called boot camp, which is the really intensive uh, four to 12 weeks uh, training that uh, provide uh, the tech side and also behavioral mindset and the soft skill that are required by the employers 
then we match the learner with the employers and then we can track the graduates and so on and have the mentor uh, aspect as well. But however, employer engagement uh, across the program life cycle from curriculum designing until placement until mentorship are really the key of what we do. Um, when we talk about partnership, these are this example of the company we work with globally. And you can see the mix and match because some of them you can see is private sector. Some of them you can see the Australian government, the EU, the Singapore government and so on because we work a lot with the government as well. And then there are also uh, philanthropies, um, foundation and non-profit sector as well. And that's come to uh, this part, which is the key on when we talk about partnership, because um, generation uh, partnership model, if you're look, looking at on the uh, left side, um, in the past, we and every other, every country that doing generation, we focus on the hybrid uh, models, which is we working with the employers, we secure uh, vacancy and, and, and job available with the employers beforehand. We work with the government. Government definitely the key, uh, not just to provide funding, but also uh, make sure that we we build capacity and um, can be expand using our model to be expand and create change in, in in such a country. And then we work a lot with the philanthropies and CSR. For example, in Thailand, we work with Microsoft philanthropies. We work with SAG Foundation and so on to understand the learners and, and the people who are facing the barrier into the, the job placement. And then um, when COVID happened and when we know that the employment and underemployment problem are large and we need something to scale it up, we have what is called power by generation model, which is the new delivery um, model that we can serve more people. And that these are the example of the two uh, of our work in Singapore and in Thailand. Because in Singapore, we also working with the government, we're working with the skill future. And in Singapore, we there are many programs, but the outstanding program, they're working with the polytechnics. Um, polytechnics are the one who do the delivery of our, our generation model. They have what it call work and learn bootcamp or earn and learn program where the government provide uh, the program together. We provide the uh, learners um, 500 Singapore dollar each month until they finish their uh, uh, training. And then more than that, the government also support employers um, about 5,000 Singapore uh, dollars so that they can um, mentor and make sure that the person that are um, recruited from generation are well prepped and be placed, uh, you know, continue with the job. And for Thailand, that we just launched in Thailand because it's a pilot project for two years. So we have been supported by Macy, Ministry of Higher Education, and also an XPO as well. And we are, uh, will work, it's a pilot model that we will work with the two industry. One is the healthcare. And another one is the digital, which is uh, the demand that the country are, are trying to build up. And we will have the university be part of this as the delivery partner and also observer to, to bring on our model, including Studio as well, which we'll speak later. They're also our training partners. So these are exciting. And for Thailand, we're aiming to create uh, 350 uh, learners and hope to place them uh, within these two years. And I think the key last, this is my last slide actually, the key takeaway from this, I, I from working at Generation, definitely one strong thing is that no single institution can solve the complex problems of unemployment and underemployment alone. We have been uh, working really closely with all our stakeholders, especially the employers and, and I believe that university and the higher education sector work really hard to tackle the problem, but sometimes uh, forgot the side of the employers uh, to work closely with them or the graduates or alumni that went into the uh, market already and learned from them. So I think those are the, uh, the good part. Another one, um, because uh, all of our curriculum are demand-led by the employer, um, that's are the key of, of making something to close the gap. 
curriculum, when we learn from what we learn from our employers, one of the things that they say they don't look for anymore, the technical skills are important, but all in all that we talk to all the employers, they're really looking for uh, behavioral skill and mindset and communication, which is beyond all the technical skill, and they're willing to take that beyond uh, comparison to the degree. Um, so those are really important. Please integrate it um, in terms of like how to ensure the decent work for the, the learners. And mentorship, um, I put in bracket regional partnership network for mentors. I think that's something that because there's a key player here as the share right head UNESCO and, and, and so on. I think it might be good to have the mentorship, which is the key for what we do, you know, in the in the region. Um, Right now, for both Singapore and um, Thailand, all of our mentors, our volunteers, and mentorship are something that when we learn from the learners, especially in Thailand and Singapore, is something that's not so common. And all the learners are really appreciated and see as like the one of the most important thing in order to bring them into the right job and descend one. And in the end, um, learners are uh, removing the barriers and leaving no one behind. I understand that higher education, sometimes it has to be mass, but sometimes mass leaving people behind. So ensure that that um, can cover everyone. Um, I just put that the, on the right hand side. That's one of the, our cohort in England uh, a while ago in 2019, but just to, to show, this is the, the role that we come up, which is a crowd support practitioner for Amazon. And in that uh, cohort, we're able to bring pretty much everyone or uh, the average of 23 or needs, which mean the dropouts, the people that are not in education, um, unemployed for more than six months. Um, 35% of them are female, 90 are Blacks, Asian, and minority basically and 30 people are with special needs um, right now many of our program are including what we call neurodiverse which is all the ADHD uh, dyslexia and so on into our program and able to recruit them into the descent one so that's my last thing for the key takes away thank you thank you so much um, it's really great to see the impact of your work in a relatively short space of time and uh, how inclusive a platform it is. So uh, much appreciated. I'm sure there will be many questions uh, on, on that. Uh, now we'll turn to Dr. Virot, who's the Managing Director of Schoolio, a leading educational technology company in Thailand, holding a PhD in operations research from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was previously a data scientist at Facebook. On returning to Thailand, Dr. Virot co-founded Schoolio, with a mission to help individuals master today's most in-demand skills and empower businesses to build the workforce of the future. Additionally, he's a strong advocate of tech for social good. Dr. Vera, thanks very much for joining us today and look forward to your presentation. Thanks for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure for me. All right, uh, so uh, let, let me start my presentation. So here at Scudio, I uh, can go to the next slide and I will talk about the mission of Scudio. So uh, as uh, Theron mentioned that uh, our mission is to help individuals master today's most in-demand skills and empower businesses to build the workforce of the future. So the two key things here. First, uh, we really focus on most in-demand skills. Uh, one of the biggest problems in the world right now is that technologies are changing fast and uh, uh, World Economic Forum actually predict that uh, over 50% of our employees need to be rescued by 2025. 20, uh, so this is a big need in, in the world. And uh, so far, a lot of higher education uh, institutes uh, focus on, on uh, undergraduate education. But as technologies are changing fast, uh, companies, uh, corporates can't keep up with the speed. And right now they have a bunch of uh, employees who who are employed for for quite some time and and now they need to reskill and upskill to be able to keep up with the with the technology disruption. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first I'll, I'll talk about what we do at Scudio. So one thing that we focus on is is to create an academy. Uh, we would like to become a digital skill academy and make sure that. Uh, 
we help Thai people uh, equipped with with uh, the most in demand skills so that they can get a better job, so that they can live a better life, and they have the capacity to to make the society a better place. So that's that's our goal. So what we've done at Studio Academy. Next, please. Uh, uh, we provide uh, a variety of learning products, uh, vary from uh, very lightweight uh, product like tutorials. Not sure if we've lost Dr. Virat. Sorry, I think my connection cut a little bit. Cut a little bit. Am I? Yep, okay. you're fine I, now. You're okay, okay. now. Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so for our learning products, we have a, a wide range of products from tutorials. It is a short video clips, 15 minutes, so that uh, people can learn how to do quick thing using spreadsheet and other tools so that they can get their work done better. Uh, a more intense one would be online courses, which range from uh, two hours to uh, 10 to 12 hours. Uh, people can learn uh, and get knowledge on certain topics. Yeah. And then we move on to uh, cost bundles, which uh, mainly a learning path. We connect uh, different courses that needed for, for developing certain skills, or we have workshops in which uh, people can interact with the experts and get feedback on the work they've done. And the last one is, is the boot camp, just like what Ms. Punyanut mentioned earlier. It's the most intense one. It's, uh, uh, for us, it's two to three months long. Uh, it's a program where we focus on helping people uh, get into a new career. So, so this is what, what we have done so far. Uh, our belief is that, can, can we move to the next slide, please? Our belief is that uh, different people learn different ways and the most effective way to teach is to blend different learning methods to match the learning goals of, of the learners. So what we have been trying to blend into our learning programs are, are four main uh, learning formats, uh, online learning uh, through online courses, which is uh, self-paced learning and uh, students can learn anywhere, anytime at the at their own pace. Uh, we have instructor-led training, uh, which is a uh, uh, workshops, which is a uh, training that, that's done in real time, uh, offline and perhaps virtual right now. Uh, and then we have peer learning uh, where people can learn from their friends. Uh, this is something that happened a lot when we were students back in school. We learn a lot from our friends. We work on projects with them. But when we become professionals, uh, we rarely get a chance to, to work with our colleagues. We, uh, we don't get to work with them and learn from them so much. So we try to create uh, this environment in, in corporate as well. And last but not least is work-based learning. Uh, a lot of time when it comes to professionals, a lot of people would say that I don't have time for, for studying. I don't have time to, to reskill, to upskill. But if you can adapt the curriculum and make sure that what they learn will eventually help them work better get their work done faster, that would be the win-win the situation. They, they can do their work better and, and they can get something done. So we try to, to blend these four methods in, into our products. Next, please. So for our online learning experience, we, we try very hard to get technology to, to, to deliver the best uh, uh, programs that, that we could. So we focus on active learning. All our learners not just sit through videos. They have exercise and sometimes it's pretty complicated exercise like what you see on, on the picture on the right. Uh, we have a course teaching how to use spreadsheet and we would have like Google Sheet embedded into our website so students can just read instructions and then play around with the spreadsheet right on the web browser. Uh, we focus on micro learnings. Uh, we uh, chop the videos into a smaller segment so that uh, working professionals can can learn like one more do at a time, a few video at a time, and then they can continue uh, regularly every day. Uh, we also try to have learning support. We have a Slack channel. We have a, a forum where people can discuss about the course, ask questions to the instructors, uh, analytics built in of time. Uh, a company uh, asked us to 
buy an online course for say like hundred or two hundred uh, employees. What we try to do is that to help them keep up with going with with the students. How many students have completed? Uh, where do they stuck? And and what are the progress? So that we can help manage the program and make sure that most people can complete the course uh, as we wish. And last but not least, we also have learning assistant. Uh, we have our mobile app. And then, as you all know, um, most of us when we apply for an online course, we normally don't get it. So how can we maximize that? So we try to not go at the right time, say after a week that they sign up, if they haven't made any progress at all, we would have like a notification to notify them. Like, why don't you just hop on for a few minutes today and, and just to keep momentum going. So this is what we have done to, to make sure we maximize the online learning experience. Next, please. Uh, for instructor-led training, it was quite easy before the COVID. We just show up and teach. But now that the COVID hit us, uh, we, we try so hard to make virtual workshops as good as the face-to-face -face version. And what we found is that uh, we can use technology and make it better than what we have done in the past. In the past, when, when you train in a big room, there would be a lot of people got left behind at the back of the room. But now, right in your uh, computer, you will see the screen very clearly. You would see the work of other teams uh, clearly uh, shown on the screen. And, and that actually increased a lot of participation. So one thing we have tried, uh, we have tried to do in React what other people to do is, is to do what we call pre-production. We don't just uh, call in Zoom and let the instructor like do it the normal way. We, we set up studio so that instructor can stand and just being able to stand, I think the energy in the classroom changed dramatically uh, uh, compared to just sitting and talk to the screen. And we also try to uh, facilitate uh, instructors by having screens for them to, to monitor the learners, monitor what's going on in the screen and have all kinds of inputs for them for example, they can write on a tablet, they can switch to a computer screen, and, and they can do many things that, that, that they wish. And this has really helped because for most professional instructors, they rely on feedback from the learners. They, they need to see like how they're reacting with the class and stuff. So by being able to set up this kind of setting, uh, we, we, we feel that we, we achieve uh, uh, our goal of making our workshops as good as face-to-face uh, -face, uh, training. Next, please. And uh, now we actually focus a lot on, on creating boot camps because boot camps really help people get into a new job. And that's really what people want. People don't want to just learn an course. What they really want is a better job, better pay, and and better life for them. So right now, so we have three boot camps focusing on data analytics, product management, and UX. Y. And in all these boot camps, we have to blend. All, all modes of learning. They can do something online and then we have a check. They have a check with us uh, once a week, once every two weeks. We also have group assignment for them so that they can share what they learn with, with their peers. And then they also have some work-based learning so that at this bootcamp, everyone will walk away with a project that can be put in their portfolio and maximize the chance to get a job they wish. Next, please. And the subject offering we, that we focus on so far are uh, digital skills, uh, either on business, data, design, and, and, and technology, uh, web application, uh, web development, app development, something like that. Next, please. And our uh, is our sixth year. We just hit our uh, fifth year anniversary last month. We're over 100,000 people that uh, enrolled and learned with us. And uh, there were almost, uh, not almost, more than 500 companies that, that have been our clients. Next, please. That was the, the first part. We, we tried to create a high quality education and we, we tried to uh, create workforce of the future so that these people can help uh, drive digital economy. So that our first uh, two SDG goals that we try to do as a company. But on the social impact side, we also try to help uh, reduce the inequalities. So what Studio have done is that we try to provide scholarships in, in most of our classes. Uh, next slide, please. So in our booth, we, we provide uh, scholarships uh, for, 
for students who actually uh, have very high potential. We believe that those students with high potential, they just need a little more nudge and then they can be like greatly successful in their career. So, so we pick this, this top group and, and make sure that they, they can join uh, our program, which is pretty costly for, for, for students, but it's uh, considered uh, reasonable for, for corporate clients. So we provide this opportunity. Also, please. Uh, in COVID, uh, we know that a lot of professors uh, in universities are uh, struggling with uh, online teaching. So we try to help them by asking them to uh, submit a syllabus to us. And if we have any courses that match what they teach on their course syllabuses, uh, we provide access to their students for free so that uh, the students can come and, and learn these online courses at their own pace. And and. For the last two years, there were over 5,000 students that we supported so far. And here's the highlight. Uh, the What I mentioned so far, we quote, it's not very sustainable for us because we, we do help students with our own money and uh, we can only help so much. Uh, we, we can't do everything we wanted to do, but with partnerships, uh, we can actually do a lot more. So we do a lot of partnerships to help bridge all the gaps. So next slides, please. I'll go through some of the examples of partnerships that we have done. First, we have partnerships with many uh, uh, leading tech companies like Line, uh, Google, Lazada. Uh, done is that this company would like to adopt that technology. Say Line would like people to use a chatbot. Google would like to have more Android developers. And Lazada would like people to, to sell more stuff on also that platform. So they have these needs. So for us, we have expertise in creating course and good content. And at the same time, all the learners, they would like to access to this good knowledge for free or at very low cost. So what we have done is that these companies are willing to pay us to create the content so that we can provide this content for free to learners. And this was hugely successful, like for online courses by, by line developers, there were over 5,000 uh, people signing up and they learned how to build chatbot for their own uh, SMEs and e-commerce. Next, please. And this is what, what we have done with, with Generation. So Generation was so great at uh, bridging the gap, as Ms. Bunjian would say. It. And what we're good at, we're good at creating content, deliver content, but we don't have the capacity to, to, to uh, give our students more chance for, for employment and we don't have uh, that connection with companies just yet. So we partner up with Generation so that we can work together and make sure that we, we can have this huge impact with those underemployment and get them decent job. Next, please. We also work with private sectors. Uh, this is KBTG, which is a subsidiary of KBank, which is one of the biggest bank in Thailand. And uh, if you all know there are talent wars these days, everybody compete for programmers and their salary is getting higher, higher and higher. There are a lot of money going on in the headhunting space. People keep stealing talents from one company to another company, but that doesn't create a bigger pool of talents. So we talk to them and, and, and try to work with them. Why don't we try to have this training program so that we have a bigger pool of talents and at the same time, KBTG can hire these students afterwards. So we create this kind of program. So it's kind of win, win, win for all. So still we create content and we, have to, we don't have to worry whether these courses sell or not. Students can learn with us. Uh, guess it's not free, but it's very cheap, 5,000 person. And they only get PR. They are different people ready to line up after the training to interview for for job. Next, please. And last but not least, we also try to uh, work with uh, with uh, local universities. So. Uh, Recently, we worked with Chulalongkorn University. They have the academic excellence with a great team of faculty members. Uh, for us, studio, we consider ourselves an industry expert in, in online learning. Uh, we want to become the operating system. We know how to sell. We know how to do marketing. We have our online learning platform ready. We have a client uh, as a cop uh, uh, corporate client. So we want to become... Uh, operating system for them. So next slide, please. Uh, last month, we just uh, 
launch a, a new initiative with them or degree plus lifelong learning beyond degrees to uh, create a platform that we bring out uh, good knowledge from university and make it available, uh, more accessible to uh, general public and also uh, companies that would like to pursue goals like sustainability, try to support aging society and try to adopt uh, latest technologies in, into that, the, the companies. And, and, and that is that, that I want to talk about Scudio. And as you, you all can see, the partnership was the, one of the biggest part that we do. It's really helped us move forward. We, we always want to provide uh, good education at no cost, but it's not possible for us as a company to do that. But with partnerships, we have people who can support us and we align our goals perfectly and that benefit everyone uh, in the society. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Virat. That's really very interesting and yeah, under, underlining the importance of partnerships to allow you and the work you're doing to scale and, and reach more people, so uh, exceptionally important. I'd now like to move swiftly on uh, and introduce Dr. Haja Yatila Zainal Abedin, CEO of Yayasan Saim Darby in Malaysia, or Saim Darby Foundation a position which she's held for more than 12 years. YSD is the philanthropic arm of the three Syme Darby companies, Syme Darby Berhad, Syme Darby Plantation Berhad, and Syme Darby Property Berhad. So Dr. Yatila, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Darren. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me to share how we at the Syme Darby Foundation, or Yayasan Syme Darby, partner with higher education institutions who have the same vision as us, to build a sustainable future by achieving what we can within our capacity of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs 2030. Next slide, please. As the philanthropic arm of the three Saim Dhabi companies, uh, Saim Dhabi Berhad, Saim Dhabi Plantation Berhad, and Saim Dhabi Property Berhad, Yayasan Saim Dhabi or YSD has the vision to lead and make a sustainable impact and difference in the lives of others through endeavors across our five pillars. We are proud to be celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Next slide. Our five pillars of education, environment, community and health, sports and arts and culture are aligned with and contribute to the achievement of the United Nations 17 SDGs to support initiatives that offer broad social, economic and environmental impacts. Next slide. Throughout the years, YSD has provided scholarships in all the countries you see on the map here. Today, our focus is in Malaysia and Papua New Guinea. Since our inception in 1982, YSD has awarded 5,300 scholarships worth more than 330, ringgit, uh, 330 million ringgit to students mostly from low-income families and to those who are differently abled, all towards achieving the SDGs. Aside from the scholarships, we also have about 85 long-term projects on hand under our five pillars, of which 12 are in partnership with eight universities towards achieving various SDGs. I would like to share them with you. Uh, the SDGs aim to be achieved with each partnership are stated on the right side of the slides, yeah, for you to see. Next slide. With the National University of Malaysia, or UKM, YSD provided a 15 million ringgit endowment for the UKM YSD Chair for Sustainability, where agreed KPIs are to be achieved every two years for a period of 10 years that focus on impact in zero waste, climate change, smart partnerships with communities, and nurturing future talents. The second uh, collaboration with UKM is the construction of the Cricket Oval with 1.4 million ringgit support to develop cricket amongst youth towards good health and well-being. The third project with UKM is the support of 530,000 ringgit for UKM's Center of Ear, Hearing and Speech Public Health Education Initiative, which is the Act Now, Here's Now program to address issues of hearing impairment in children with greater public awareness, parental empowerment, and effective management among healthcare professionals. Slides, uh, next slide, please. Our partnership with University of Malaya enables us to, number one, 
work with its Center for Development Studies on the Royal Prof uh, Professor Unku Aziz Chair towards poverty eradication with an endowment of 2.5 million ringgit. And number two, work with the charity arm of its medical center to purchase the necessary equipment for poor patients who are financially constrained but are in critical need of surgery to live. With YSD's commi uh, committed funding of uh, 9 million ringgit for 12 years, we have saved almost a thousand lives so far. Next slide. We have two project collaborations with the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. The first one is a partnership that started way back in 2012 towards human elephant coexistence management to save the endangered species under the Management and Ecology of Malaysian Elephants or MEME research project with a commitment of more than 8 million ringgit. The second collaboration is Assess Corp with a commitment of about 1.5 million ringgit to address impending global food shortage due to effects of climate change focusing on underutilized crops by using scientific research and capacity building while increasing livelihoods of poor families through the production and sales of underutilized crop products. Next slide. We are in partnership with Ohio University Center for International Studies with a 750,000 US dollar endowment for the Tun Razak Chair, named after Malaysia's second prime minister. The chair has been in existence since 1979 and has seen 15 Malaysian scholars as intellectual ambassadors. The Tun Razak chair aims to introduce and raise awareness in the US on Malaysian history, culture, economy, and social and political issues. Next slide. Uh, we are also in partnership with University Technology Mara to support a pre-diploma program that provides a second chance to extremely poor students who are unable to secure university placements after their national high school examinations. So far, we have committed 11 million ringgit that has assisted almost 7,000 students. Not only do an average of 80% of them make it to tertiary studies, I know of a few who even went on to do their postgraduate degrees. These youth are now able to bring their families out of poverty, armed with tertiary education qualifications. Next slide, please. We are supporting University of Malaysia Sabah with a commitment of 2 million ringgit for three years to restore 102 hectares of hilly forest and riparian buffers within the oil palm landscapes of the Saim Dabi Plantation Sandakan Bay Estates with a research and student capacity building. We intend to develop an e-manual to be made available to the public on the most cost-effective and impactful approach to increase biodiversity in oil palm plantations. Next slide. YSD is working with University Utara Malaysia to address the critical dropout issue among more than 10,000 at-risk secondary school students in the state of Kedah in Malaysia, working with the State Education Office and the Ministry of Education. This partnership sees YSD support of 450,000 ringgit in a project that integrates three research areas towards impact on the ground with set KPIs and deliverables to be achieved to reduce school drop dropouts. Next slide. YSD is also in a collaboration with International Islamic University Malaysia or IIUM to provide access to basic health care via supporting the renovations and operations of a polyclinic in the university town of Pago for about 9,000 university and college students from four uh, education institutions, their lecturers and support staff, as well as the local community surrounding the area, including the indigenous communities with our 1.8 million commitment for four years. And the next slide. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, about us, please just scan the QR code. You get our annual report. Thanks. Thanks. That's uh, an extensive body of partnership and activity. Thank you very much, Dr. Yatila. And we will be coming to questions, I'm sure. Now over to uh, Mr. Bob Fox, Vice President of the European Association of Business and Commerce. Chair of the Digital Economy ICT Group for the EABC and Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce in Thailand. Bob, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. I realize we're getting close to six o'clock, so I'll try to keep it relevant, very relevant. Many people ask, I think we've got some slides here. Oh, okay. 
Can you show it to you? Oh, well, let's start in the interest of time. Um, many people ask, why does a Chamber of Commerce, why is a Chamber of Commerce, where does this go? Okay. Many people ask, why is a Chamber of Commerce interested in education? Why is a Chamber of Commerce interested in sustainability? And moreover, if you put these two things together, why would we be interested? Well, if you look at Thailand as an investment destination, the literature always says, skilled workforce, Thailand 4.0, come here and invest. If you're a local company, these messages are just as relevant. You want to build a business in Thailand. You want to build a business that's innovative, that's world leading, and can use Thailand as a base to go out to the region and the world. There's no reason why in today's world we shouldn't take responsibility, whether we are a large company or a small company, for the communities and the societies in which we work and in which we invest. These responsibilities may not have been a great feature of business worlds decades ago, but they certainly are now. If we look at some of the big companies we've heard today investing in societal development, educational development, contributing to contributing to um, sustainability. And we think of some wealthy people, robber barons in the past. Andrew Carnegie, Leyland Stanford, Ezra Cornell. These were not people who were particularly admired for their social skills or their, what they did to societies at the time. And I can say closer to home, a name you may not know so well, Alan Bond. In the 1980s, he was a bad guy. But all four of those people put in place institutions of bricks and mortar universities, which are leading brands in higher education in the world today. Why did they do it? Well, there's probably a variety of reasons. They did it for their own glory to some extent, but they also had a, a great belief in education of future generations and the idea that an educated society and an educated economy is not only going to do better for that society and economy, but it will do um, better for people at, a, uh, at an individual and group and economic level. I'm just going to quickly go through a few things. These are the two institutions or chambers that I'm covering. Uh, you may have heard of them, you may not have. Uh, the Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce is um, 34 foreign chambers, been around for 45 years, 9,000 end member companies. Uh, the EABC or Eurocham Thailand has a limited number of direct member companies, been around for 11 years, really promoting European business and trade, but in both cases heavily involved in advocacy. And we'll come to see a bit later some of the things that they're focusing on more interestingly and more recently. So, um, what we find is that the means of doing education and training in Thailand are somewhat limited in terms of really investing, if you want to take advantage of investment promotion. So for example, the BOI promotes human resource development, but it's mainly in science and technology. And there are political reasons for these limitations. We work to remove the political reasons. Many people comment on the education system in Thailand and the idea that we do too much rote learning. So if we've looked at the kind of skills that are being inculcated in the speakers that we've heard before, it's about digital skills, it's about developing inquiring minds, it's about critical thinking. These are somewhat out of sync with the 12 pillars that the government leaders in this country promoted a couple of years ago. Are they intentionally that way? I don't know. But definitely, if we go down that channel, we are not going to develop inquiring minds and critical thinking skills, and therefore, changes in education. So we need to see changes where 
um, at the at the primary and secondary level in terms of the whole education apparatus and teacher source pool and training. Let's go on to the next topic. At the tertiary level, there are many studies on engagement in the tertiary level in R&D and how relevant it is to what's needed in the scientific and business world. So relevance becomes a very important, um, important thing. We did a study on foreign universities in Thailand and found that the attractiveness is very, very limited. Um, you can see big name foreign universities in certain other ASEAN member states, such as Malaysia and Singapore, very limited in Thailand. There was an OECD report mid-2021 that showed a great mismatch between skills and demand in Thailand. And so the recommendation from OECD was to realign. So what we've heard today perhaps is some efforts to do that realignment in effect by looking at developing skills which are more aligned with what people need. I want to mention a project called JFCCT Passport. It's a working title. It's just being developed now with a couple of pilots going on. This is an idea about quality, high quality vocational learning, um, partnering with a leading private secondary school to transfer the bases of the learning. It's only just getting off the ground. The principles are being informed, ambitious, engaging, personal, and collaborative. The base level vocational training is about bridging the gap between the classroom and the workplace, mapping a one of a kind learning journey, helping young people to thrive at work, seeing business challenges. And then in this, there's going to be various skills <clears throat> where people can compete in a digital first world. So clearly digital skills are terribly important. And then we have critical thinking, problem solving, adaptability and resilience as the things that are being taught this is being developed. It is nowhere near as developed as you've heard from some of the other speakers today. It's called Passport because it's entry level and it's designed to be built upon for vertical sectors. So for example, hospitality, manufacturing and others. Thailand has a fantastic reputation in hospitality. In 2019, we had 39.8 million foreign tourists. In 2020, they're all in the first three months, 6.7 million, and in 2021, something like 400,000. What's it going to be this year? Estimates are about three to four million. But this is a huge difference on uh, impact on GDP. 2019 was close to 20%. There is a great need to make the hospitality industry greener and upskilled. And the reskilling of the hospitality industry, which has been gutted by people moving away, by people um, going through the so-called great resignation, and unfortunately, in many cases, people being let go, who do not appear in unemployment statistics because they're doing part-time work elsewhere. So what you see in the unemployment statistics is not an accurate reflection of what's going on in some of these sectors. So... Um, we are also in both of these organizations with some real speed now developing sustainability competence areas through working groups and people who are committed to doing these things. So it's about sustainability integration, the idea that you integrate the goals into everything you do in business. Thailand has a major policy push through BCG and that's one avenue. It becomes relevant also to foreign uh, trade agreements, and these things have to be taken into account. We need to be a greener and upskilled economy to do well in the world. I think that's, I just want to summarize with a few things. The first thing is about relevance. When we train, think about how relevant it is. Don't underestimate the soft skills, that is critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork. These things are absolutely essential, sometimes more essential than technical skills. I have also seen over the many years that I've been working on uh, upskilling and education, probably about 15 years in Thailand in various ways, 
a real lack of self-confidence and self-belief in the ability to do things. We like to believe that we can tell young people, you can do anything. And we like to tell young women and girls that especially, you can do anything with your life as long as you put your mind to it and get the right support. I believe that everything we do, we need to reinforce these self-belief ideals because education is not about simple top-down transfer. Experiential learning is an absolutely key vital part of it. And that doesn't work unless people have a self-belief that they can digest, they can learn, they can learn about themselves and they can learn how to grow. This is not rote learning. This is about empowerment and this is terribly important. So I would like to leave these thoughts with you um, and I invite any of you to join us through the various chamber organizations. Um, please get in touch with me or just go to the websites mentioned. But uh, we really uh, want to make sure that we are developing more uh, about education, reskilling, and also making sure that our businesses are more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I think you've really encapsulated a lot of the discussion today. Um, I suppose your words remind me of a, a famous quote by Oscar Wilde. Education is not the filling of the pail, or a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Uh, and I think we need to, to remember that. We've had a lot of time over the last number of years to think about doing things differently in higher education, um, from digitalization to, to how we work together, how we be more inclusive. Uh, but I'd like to ask our panelists today, and perhaps a, a bit of a synthesis of some of the questions that have come in, um, what do they see as being the, the key uh, and the, the key item that would need to change to ensure stronger and more sustainable partnerships between higher education institutions, civil society, and the private sector? So very much from your own perspectives, uh, what do you see as uh, the key catalyst uh, to ensuring more sustainability in these partnerships. So I'll leave it to uh, whoever uh, has the, the first comments to, to jump in. Um, can I share? Um, can I share? Please Derek? talk to you. Um, for us to work together, for these partnerships to work sustainably, we'll need to have the same objectives, the big main objectives, going to, uh, to the SDG 17 objectives safe. And then as we go along, the objectives would be um, more, how to say, more detailed, yeah? Like from our experience at Yayasan Saimda, be working with the universities. The universities are um, a lot on academic research, but we want to see impact on the ground. So we have to get ourselves al al aligned with the objectives of what we want to achieve together towards uh, the the larger objectives. So in order for us to work sustainably, we'll have to align all our objectives. Thank you very much. I completely agree. We need certainly cohesion. Um, any comments? Yeah, I was going to say um, that, which is the ladies, our panelists already uh, said, but I let me add that maybe after seeing the same goals, I think partnerships means equal, equal, um, roles, equal, you know, like um, when we work together, we try, have to manage how to make sure that the win-win and win and win and win situation, not just between the partner, but the goal and the people that we are working towards on. You know, so to me, um, beyond the same, same goals, second is to uh, work together in the real partnership that everyone's gain and bring the most benefit out in, in whatever we do. Absolutely. Dr. Virat. Yeah, I was yeah. about to say exactly what both <laughs> panelists have There's said. a lot of cohesion on the uh, panel, that's for sure. Uh, clear goals uh, is... Clear Clear goals are definitely the most important thing, I would say, uh, because, for example, our partnership with, say, KPTG, they can easily spend a lot of money on headhunting and they can still uh, uh, feel headcount fine, but they decided to 
to went down this path with us because they see the need of creating the bigger talent pools, and that would be a greater benefits for all things like that. So I think like they can do. Uh, each party can do the old way they want, and they can still succeed. But if we can align the goal, we, we can uh, change the way we do things and and gain uh, better benefits. And also to add to what Ms. Punyanu just said is that partnership generally don't come easy. It's not like I'll do things the way I do, you do things the way you do, and partnership would happen. It usually means like. I do thing this way because I concern about A, B, C, and D. And you do things your way because you concern about A, B, C, and D. What would be the best solution that address uh, both parties' concern? And we work together to get the solutions that that truly a win-win uh, solution. It's fantastic. Yeah, certainly an ecumenical approach. Bob. Well, I think. People do things and companies do things largely for self-interest. And let me explain that. Does that mean you're going to be selfish? No. It means that you have a self-interest in contributing to the community that you work in because that's part of your responsibility. It's part of your commitment. But I would say, in terms of alignment, that you have to make sure that whatever somebody's asked to do is therefore within their self-interest, as I have defined it. People won't do things if they don't see it beneficial, to be beneficial for their organization. In fact, remember the principles of corporate governance. A company has to act in accordance with the interests of. Uh, it used to be its members. In other words, if it was a company, its shareholders. Now it's broader. Now it's its stakeholders, and you have to define who those stakeholders are. But you will get into trouble as a company if you start to act not in the interests of that stakeholder community as you define it. So what I would say in terms of alignment and partnerships is, you have to be mindful of what the interests are of each party, and I don't believe that's a big problem as long as you think about it and work it through. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. I think we could all agree that the sustainable development goals are in all of our interests. And pursuing uh, a common action towards that and, and a cohesive approach to that um, is going to be uh, critical for all of us. I'd like to, uh, first of all, correct myself. Uh, as an Irishman, I shouldn't have got this wrong, but uh, it wasn't Oscar Wilde. It was uh, William Butler Yeats who said, uh, education is the filling of a pail. Not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. I'd also like to apologize for running over time, but I did feel that it was important that we uh, tie up the session. I'd like to thank all of the, the panelists, all of the participants uh, today, all of you who joined uh, online. Uh, I think it's been a very good start and we're looking forward to continuing the discussion over the coming days. Thank you all very much. Education and training has been one of the hardest hit sectors during the pandemic. For this reason, partnerships between higher education institutions and the private sector in the region is crucial in contributing to graduate employability. University and employer engagement is not just an option, but a necessity to produce a competitive and the future ready workforce.
right. it taught me how to be more sensitive and understanding to other people's different cultures or working styles, political and social worldview, and the identities that they associate with. The proven records of how we skillfully navigate differences and play well in a team made up of people from like really diverse backgrounds. If we do nothing about the curriculum, our, our, our basic curriculum now, uh, and the world continue to change, uh, there will come a day where our students are equipped with knowledge that is not what the world comes. Ranging from software development, to cloud and data, data and AI, cybersecurity, privacy and trust. This is really going to be the main um, type of opportunities that is out there. I would still encourage uh, the internationalization and mobility, uh, but the design needs to be something more inclusive, more flexible. We need to get the engagement of the stakeholders and players are, are included. And assessment is a key. key. Congratulations on the official launch. The EU is very proud to support this process in ASEAN for the SHARE program. I am extremely pleased that the EU and the, through the EU SHARE program has launched the communities of practice. The importance of a community of practice goes beyond the exchange of ideas within the community, but actually the unity and collaboration between practice and policy. The SHARE program continues its commitment to support the future readiness of ASEAN students and graduates through the implementation of digital modalities of internationalization, such as virtual exchange, collaborative online international learning, and digital credentials.